And um, welcome to, oh my gosh, this seems like I'm really right up front to it, but um, welcome to the September 12th City Council meeting. Um, we welcome a number of new people to join us and excited to see those that are returning. So I'd like to actually uh, make sure because we have a new group that we have introductions here as well as at the dais when we go downstairs for the meeting. And I'll start with Mr. Bakari. Mr. Bakari, District 6. Ed Drees, District 7. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Marcus Jones, City Manager. By Lyles, Mayor. Uh, Braxton Winston, serving at large and as Mayor Pro Tem. Luana Mayfield, serving at large. Dimple Ajmera, serving at large. All right. And the City Clerk. Billy Tynes, Deputy City Clerk. And we have today, um, Mr. Baker has had his surgery and he's recovering from that surgery. And so we're joined by the deputy. Um, introduce yourself, please. Good evening, Lena James, deputy city attorney. All right, thank you very much. Um, I wanna call our action review time to order and say welcome, thank you for everyone that's joining us. This is the time that we actually talk about the work that we're doing and what's coming up in front of us so that people can have an opportunity to see and hear from the staff what we're trying to accomplish in moving forward. But before we go to directly to that agenda, let's have, um, Marie, will you talk to us about the council consent item questions and the changes that have been made as a result from the time that the agenda went out to today? Yes, ma'am, and good evening. Good evening. Uh, you, before you, you should have on your um, seats the questions and answers from today's um, agenda items so far, and I ask you to take a minute to look over those, and hopefully we've followed up with any of you that had specific questions already, but um, specifically on consent as well, are there any additional questions? And while you're looking over, I know the clerk and the mayor will also note for you, but there was one item, item number... 46 on your consent agenda that's been pulled by staff for this evening and that was the last consent item all right so pull means that the staff has decided that it would come off of the agenda so um 46 should be come so when we talk about the consent agenda items um let me ask if there before we when we go through that are there any com items that sh people want to comment on on the con on, on the consent agenda all right, are there any items that council would like to see as a separate vote on the consent agenda? Hearing none, then we will um, say that if we can have a motion to adopt the consent agenda and except for item 46, um, could we have a motion? So moved. We have second. A, we have a motion and a second. I don't think there's any discussion since we just walked through the items. So with that, if you would raise your hand, is that easier? I want to ask the clerk, is it easier for us to have our names raised today? Okay. If you would raise your hand, all in favor, raise your hand. Anyone opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. So um, we you. have completed our consent agenda, and now we'll go to our action review items, and I'd like to recognize the manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, tonight we have two presentations. The first presentation is uh, regarding our efforts around safety and violence reduction, and the second we're, we'll provide you with an update on our disparity study. Before we go to those presentations, I would like to talk a little bit about our approach to tonight. Uh, so this is the new council's first action review, and we wanted to give you as much information as we could prior to coming tonight, and I hope we didn't inundate you with too much information. Uh, as we went through the orientation, it was clear that uh, being able to have you prepared is very important as we come to these action reviews. And so we typically publish the agenda on Thursday, which was in your packet. I think some of you may have been surprised for some Friday calls that you received from your assistant city manager. But again, trying to go through some of the topics that were here today and to see if there were any issues. 
Uh, I'm very appreciative for uh, the Mayor Pro Tem as he reached out, I think, to some of you also to get us with hitting the ground running on this, this first uh, meeting. Uh, and Marie also works with you to send out any questions that you may have regarding the agenda. I think uh, Councilmember Mayfield probably had the, the, the most, and we appreciate uh, the thoroughness of, of going through that. So earlier today, you had a couple of pre-reads. Of one is essentially the second presentation that you will see, as well as a, a pre-read, a couple of pages, dealing with Safe Charlotte, as well as with the, um, the update on the disparity study. So I just wanted to kind of set the, the stage for what we're trying to achieve tonight in terms of this action review. And Mayor, if there aren't any questions, I'd like to lead off with the Safe Charlotte uh, presentation. So we do have uh, tonight uh, both Chief Jennings as well as we have Federico Rios who will talk a bit about our efforts around uh, Safe Charlotte. And I have just one slide. Instead of you know having an overview for you, it's really talking about you know where we have been. And I think the slide captures it. If you uh, think back to 2019, when we started to have a spike in violence in the city, we reached out to John Hopkins and GovX to really get some data to see how we could uh, tackle this. And during that same uh, period of time, it, this morphed into this framework to address violence. It actually is a framework that was adopted by the city council as well as the county uh, commissioners and it has pillars that are the exact same across you know, both, both bodies. And if you move down, we started off having conversations about hot spots, and then there were priority areas, and then they morphed into our corridors of opportunity, which we have six, which is not just about, let's say, policing, but also about access to jobs, housing, safe mobility options, as well as proactively addressing crime. And then finally, as we get back into that May-June 2020 time period, that's when the council started to work on reimagining policing. Uh, three months, each council committee at that time took a, a deep dive into what are some areas that can be discussed that can help us at addressing you know, violence as a public health crisis. I, I will tell you that this was the combined efforts of staff, CMPD, our community input groups as well as the council and it resulted in a safe charlotte report which fed will talk a little bit about uh, tonight and the reason that we're having that discussion is there's an item on the agenda and out of all the things that we try to make sure that we brief you whether it's a strategy session or coming out of a committee um, before and even an action briefing before we actually put something on the agenda for a vote this is one of those strange situations where we have a crossover in, in council just as we were queuing this up. So that if you have a lot of information, one of the reasons we wanted to do that was so that you would have as much as you can before we started having the conversation with you tonight. And that's what we're attempting to do. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Jennings. Just uh, right click, all right. Thank you, Mr. Manager, Madam Mayor, members of council. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Uh, Good to see some familiar faces and along with some new faces. But uh, I'm gonna go through some slides very quickly. Uh, I know time is limited, uh, but hopefully it'll give you an overview of what we're looking at within CMPD and some of the changes not only that we have made and some directions that we're looking at within our department. So um, some of the old news that you've probably heard before at, um, I was sworn in in June of 2020. Uh, implemented my core four uh, values within our agency, uh, and that includes employee wellness, community collaboration, crime management, and professional accountability. And my strategic goal in those is that within my administration, that if we can accomplish and have our goals towards these core four items, that we would have a very successful uh, police department. Uh, our mission and our vision had been the same for probably over 30 years. And when we went back and did a retreat, uh, soon after uh, I was sworn in as the ch police chief, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that our mission was up to date and focused on what we are 
uh, what our goals are set for in today's era. So CMPD's mission now states that CMPD will implement solutions and exp expand collaborative relationships within our organization and community to enhance trust, fairness, respect, uh, to increase public safety. And our vision is we envision becoming the trusted, respected, sought after community partner by serving our citizens and taking care of our employees. So if we back, uh, rewind back uh, late uh, after 2020, we remember that uh, Campaign Zero had the eight can't wait campaign, which had eight requests of, all, of departments uh, that they would implement within their policies. Um, not to belabor this, but CMPD worked with the Campaign Zero uh, and within uh, probably six months, we were able to implement all eight and satisfy all eight requirements of eight can't wait. We were at the time one of 10 agencies that were compliant with all eight of these, of these recommendations. And that was something that we were very proud of and took a lot of hard work uh, and back and forth. And during that process, we learned a lot as well as Campaign Zero learned a lot when it came to uh, uh, our agency and how we implemented in, in our policies and what our policies meant. So, we wanted to look at the state of employees. I knew that during 2020, the, the difficult times that we were having within uh, policing in general, that I wasn't concerned with our officers at the moment. I was more concerned with what they, how they would feel after all of we came down off of that mountaintop and some of the responses that we were having to to address back then so some of the things that came from the uh, climate and culture survey of our employees that the concerns were communication uh, based on the flow of information that we had from the top down uh, act and also active listening listening to the employees as far as what they wanted and what how they wanted to see our agency uh, move forward as well and transparency amongst the ranks as well so they wanted to a lot more of what's going on when before those decisions are made and to be able to have that community which all goes in with the communication also low morale which was nothing new across the country that a lot of uh, police uh, departments were dealing with so we went i'm not going to read all of this we went basically from a uh, mission-centered focus to a people-centered focus to make sure that we were looking after our employees and you can read on the right some of the things that we wanted to value when it came to being people focused. And then uh, we launched a major initiative in 2021, which was our customer service base, CMPD serves uh, our um, initiative on how we treat people, not just how we treat people within, uh, that we come in contact with out in the public, but also how we treat each other. Uh, and I thought that was very important to, to one, to go towards morale, that my concept is that we want to be day makers in every day that we, that we have contacts with individuals to the fullest extent that we can. And you look at some of the results, we have all of our CMPD officers have received the initial training and we're launching the second phase of this training uh, this month, actually. And we have 150 acts of excellence awards. So the whole point of all of this results is we want to be able to catch our officers doing something right and 150 Acts of Excellence Awards, 4,300 body-worn camera tags for positive work. So we, uh, we are able to let supervisors tag for positive work as well as officers who want to be recognized and say, this is something that we feel like is positive, that I was a day maker, uh, that I was able to make a difference with the person I came in contact with. And then plus uh, 75 plus roll call meetings. And we are also the first agency in the country uh, to uh, have customer experienced officers that will be graduating this December uh, on um, uh, within our agency. We have, well, this will bring our numbers up to four employees that are customer experience officers uh, that have received the training. And last year we were received the revolutionary uh, customer, I'm sorry, revolutionary company of the year from the customer service revolution uh, conference in, in Ohio and we were proud of that award as well. And these are some of the milestones that I'll let you read that uh, some of these are particularly, we look at, we doubled our uh, community police and crisis response team is actually thanks to uh, our council uh, that recommended and funded for us to do that. So we were able to go from six to 12. 
Uh, we've also looked at um, uh, this, just over this past year, we've updated 35 directives and policies within our agency, uh, launched a new policy uh, team, which is a civilianized team that will be looking and constantly looking at our policies and looking at where we can improve based on not just things that we see within um, our jurisdiction, but across the country as well. And also launched a new public records team. So we hired um, uh, additional people to help assist with our public records request. Uh, I think we've had over 600 public records requests year to date, uh, and we are trying to make sure that we stay on top of those as much as we can uh, and make sure that we don't have uh, too many outstanding and be a little bit more efficient there. And uh, there's some other things on there that, I'll, that I won't read, but you should, you should have that uh, in your documents. So addressing violent crime. So far year to date, our violent crime is up 2%. And some of the efforts that we're looking at, and I'll talk about gun violence in a, in a little bit, but uh, back to school prevention, uh, violence prevention was one of the key factors. If you remember last year, uh, the first semester of school from, De from August till December, there were several guns that were confiscated out of our schools. Uh, and, and even one incident that involved an actual shooting. And working with CMS, and to be able to make sure that we didn't see this year start out similar to what we saw last year, uh, we wanted to make sure that we did, took some initiative to continue the work that we saw at the second semester of last year. In our jurisdiction, we had 28 total guns that were, um, that were found in schools, and 25 of those guns were found from the August to December semester. So we wanted to make sure that that continued on to this year and so far, it seems we're being successful in that area as well. And also our active shooter training within CMPD and thanks to our police foundation, well, we were able to do some very extensive and very quick active shooter training, uh, hands-on active shooter training with, with our officers. Uh, probably, I think if not all, the majority of our officers have already gone through that training, uh, which was a very uh, monumental feat to be able to uh, take on within a short, few short months. So violence, gun violence within juveniles uh, is the main concern that I have, and I know I've had some discussions with some, some of you council members in reference to uh, violence in juveniles and guns in particular. Uh, and year to date, we've had 118 juvenile suspects of firearms-related offenses this year. 482 juvenile victims this year of gun-related violence. And then one of the things that we're also Look, glad to see is a 12% reduction in shooting in the occupied dwellings, which is where people just go into shoot at a house with disregard to um, sanctity of life of anyone inside that residence as well. So we've had some work that we've been able to do uh, and make some good arrests that have brought that number down just a little bit compared to last year. And we're up 6% 6 in, 6 in guns recovered. 2,000 guns, and those are illegal guns that we're taking off the street. Uh, which is very, very significant to think about if we're recovering that many guns off of our streets uh, throughout this year, then you have to think about how many guns are actually out there that are being involved in uh, illegal activity. Two initiatives uh, with or groups that we have within our agency divisions, our violent criminal apprehension team. Uh, these are the uh, officers that go after some of the most violent criminals within our society. And so far, they have made 288 arrests this year. And if you, as you can see, 86 of those were for murder. And our crime gun suppression team, which is a newer team that was developed specifically to go after uh, those individuals that are committing crimes with, uh, that are involving guns and they're intentional about the individuals that they're targeting for uh, arrest for those gun crimes. And they've made 162 arrests so far this year. 155 firearms seized, and 23 of those were recovered being stolen. And property crime is another issue that, uh, you know, violent crime is my priority right now along with recruiting, but property crime is a, is a concern as well that we still have to continue to address. Uh, and just quickly, I won't go through all of this, but if we look through at our commercial burglaries, which are up 42% right now, uh, and our auto thefts up 16 percent, and in a, in a way, that's kind of a, a, a victory for us, given the um, the uh, 
Kia challenge with the auto thefts that we've seen over the internet where young people are stealing uh, Hyundais and Kias and um, those numbers have gone up drastically and have really taken a big dent on some of the um, issues we're trying to address with property crime, but we are seeing some positive results at, with some of the work that we've been uh, seeing. So uh, the catalytic converters are always gonna be an issue. We are starting to see some of those go down as well where people are cutting catalytic converters off of uh, vehicles and uh, it takes about 30 seconds to do that. And that's been uh, something that we're trying to track down and make sure that we're not only targeting the people that are stealing them, but also the ones that are taking them in on the black market uh, and, and paying money to individuals for that. And these are some of the challenges that we are looking at that we have to address. And uh, I've been pretty vocal about the low bail and bond issues that we're seeing. Uh, particularly with the most violent criminals uh, and the repeat offenders. If you look at our violent crime, when we usually arrest somebody for a violent or heinous crime, uh, often you can look at their record and see that they've been arrested multiple times over and over again. Uh, and so that's a concern with this as well. Uh, and I am working with, um, the, um, uh, with the magistrates, also Chief uh, District Court Judge um, Elizabeth Trosh has been really great in f as far as our conversations are concerned on how can we start looking to work together uh, to help change the scenario and what we're seeing, uh, not just in Charlotte, but across the state and across the country. Uh, also court backlogs as courts begin to open up and again, our staffing uh, concerns as well within CMPD. And these are just some of the things that we've done as far as recruitment. And the biggest thing is the, our marketing and advertising campaign that we want to make sure that we get our brand and our message out so that we can attract more people to become police officers, not just as a job, but as a career for us. Uh, and right now we're looking at around a 280 vacancy, sworn vacancies uh, within our agency, which is extremely high. And that number does change day to day based on who's retiring, who leaves, and also as we were uh, hire and start academy classes, uh, that number would fluctuate as well. So with that includes uh, current academy classes that are in play. So those officers aren't available just yet to us, but at least we have them hired at this point going through the training process. And um, I'm not gonna go through each of those, but if you have any questions about that, and I think that's that's all for my presentation. I don't know if I'm answering questions now or answering them later. Yeah. Why don't we ask, um, Federico to join us? All right, we'll ask Federico to join the chief and in, um, in this presentation as well with his responsibilities and accountabilities in this area, particularly around the idea of how do we actually address some of the things that we have in the community as the chief talked about them. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Mr. council. Mr. Rios, thank you. Uh, Federico Rios, I serve uh, as the assistant director in our Housing and Neighborhood Services Department, specifically over our Office of Equity, Mobility, and Immigrant Integration. It's an honor to be here tonight. Clicker works. All right. All right, so uh, Mr. Manager, you referenced the framework to address violence. Um, this has many pillars. Uh, I won't go over each. We will spend uh, the bulk of our time on the interruption of violence there in the middle. But I did want to reference that in the pre-read uh, that was mentioned earlier, there's more information regarding our Safe Charlotte grant, uh, which was specifically referenced to the Safe Charlotte report. Uh, in addition, there is information related to the hospital-based violence intervention program that we have partnered with HRM Health. Uh, to do in their trauma center. I will specifically be speaking to our Alternatives to Violence program. And uh, in context, I really want you all to uh, understand that we are undertaking the utilization of the Cure Violence model, an evidence-based model that comes out of Chicago that has been utilized in cities around the world. Uh, it employs an epidemiological approach. So epidemiological approach goes back to this idea of violence as a public health crisis, and it's really the isolation of a disease. If we recognize that violence spreads much like a disease spreads, you wanna treat it as such and isolate accordingly. Um, 
And this is done through the cure violence model, which employs uh, a, a multi-tiered approach. So there's canvassing, there's relationship building, there's case management, there's conflict mediation, rapid response to violence incidences, and most importantly, community behavior change. This takes time and continual effort to see forth results. So to offer context, um, this program has been launched as of August of 2021 in the Beatty's Ford Road Corridor. As you can see on this slide, uh, the program during that initial time period from 2017 when we were first uh, tracking information in this corridor specific to our implementation of this model. And as of the end of last month, we have continued to see uh, challenges related to violent crime incidents and homicides. Um, aggravated assault continues to drive the violent crime that has occurred in this area, even specific uh, to the first eight months of this year. And there has been aggravated assaults that continue to be perpetrated in this corridor. What makes the cure violence model correct for this area is the relational nature of the crime. These are crimes that are typically happening amongst individuals that know one another. These are not crimes of opportunity, but crimes of relationship. I'd like to acknowledge Tracy Campbell, who's in the room. Uh, Tracy serves as the head of the Office of Violence Interruption with Mecklenburg County, our partner on this initiative, as you see in the slides. Uh, we have partnered with Mecklenburg County to begin this program uh, in year one. The program was co-funded by both entities at $250,000 apiece. We then worked with Cure Violence Global uh, to provide methodology and technological support. So again, uh, Cure Violence Global comes in and ensures that we are remaining uh, faithful to the model and providing all the appropriate resources to execute on said model. Uh, again, we as Mecklenburg County and the City of Charlotte partner to monitor and provide staffing and resource support. So Tracy, myself, and Melena Price, who serves as the project coordinator for this on our end, um, are going out monthly meeting with the team uh, going over cases, ensuring that they have any resource support that they need. The team is led by youth advocate programs who won the RFP for this contract, um, and they are the ones implementing the model as of now in the Betty Sword Road Corridor. I'm excited to share that last year uh, we began a partnership with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, again referencing the information that the chief has shared. Uh, that partnership is noteworthy. Uh, in fact, no, very few of the models that have been, of the cure violence models that have been implemented in the United States have a direct partnership with their school system. And so we're excited to have that in place. Again, referencing what the chief has mentioned and what you saw on a previous slide regarding the age of the individuals that oftentimes are either victims or perpetrators of crime in this area. Um, this has specifically worked really well at West Charlotte High School. Uh, quick anecdote. On the first day when uh, we set up the meeting for the partnership to be evaluated, uh, upon entering the campus, the Youth Advocate Program staff was asked to mediate uh, a conflict that was occurring that day related to a gun and social media. And so we knew that moment that this was the right course of action to take forward. Uh, we are currently in the process, YAP is currently in the process of renewing uh, their MOU for the 22-23 school year. So we recognize that we are uh, a year into this program, but there have been dramatic shifts related to the program. And so we have been advised by Cure Violence Global to not provide an a full annual assessment because the data is skewed uh, to do so. What we can share is that we've had a total of currently 19 program participants, 48, 45 mediations that have been completed. These are mediations that would have led to a violent incident in the corridor and have been engaged in by individuals that are at highest risk of violence. Uh, it's important on that last data point to share that the hot spot that makes up the Beatty Sword Road Corridor has cooled down. Now that can't conclusively be attributed to one program or intervention. I don't wanna take shine away from the chief and his efforts and all of the other efforts that have occurred with community-based organizations, but it is a positive indicator that the work is having a positive effect. Um, again, we recently extended YAP services to implement the ATV program in that corridor for one additional year. 
Um, that is for a multitude of reasons, but especially because we are undertaking a three-year evaluation with UNC Charlotte uh, and for the sake of continuity of service. I'm excited to share that tonight, uh, members of council, you will have the opportunity to vote on the acceptance of a $1 million grant from the Department of Justice. This is a congressional earmark that uh, came through Congresswoman Alma Adams' office, and so we are especially grateful for her and uh, this opportunity. I'd like you to take into account that the city spent $250,000 in year one of this program, matched by the $250,000 that the county put forward and since its inception, along with this million dollars and the $1.2 million that Wells Fargo and the Greenlight Fund have put in, you have seen a $2.2 million return on your investment. Uh, we have worked with Cure Violence Global. As you can see, these are actually cluster maps uh, that designate two areas with a high incidence of crime, uh, specifically violent crime, uh, which are typically homicides and assaults with a deadly weapon. And we have determined that there are three locations that would be best fits for the, um, for the expansion of this initiative. Those would be Nations Ford and Arrowwood Road, Southside Homes, and West Boulevard and Remount Road. I have, uh, in communication with Cure Violence Global, proposed that we undertake this as two sites. We would actually have a site in Nations Ford and Arrowwood, and then a combined larger site that would expand between Southside and West Boulevard, given their proximity. Uh, we are waiting on Cure Violence Global to solidify dates where they would come out and evaluate what the proper staffing model for that expansion would be considering the size of the area. Um, the RFP will go out in early winter of 2022. It's important to share that the RFP will not go out solely for these two sites, but also for the Betty Sword Road site. We wanna ensure that we are consistently looking for the best possible providers for this model um, across the continuum of care. Additionally, uh, we hope to have the host organizations all selected and online uh, beginning to hire staff May of 23 with, further, with the full implementation coming in August of that year. With that, any questions? On to the questions, I want to say thank you to the chief and Mr. Rios for the presentation. And I really just wanted to say a few words. Um, if you remember, we had our council orientation and we talked about priorities and we've been talking about our priorities for a while. But two things that really stood out for me is that we talked about and been asked about quality of life issues. And all of us have said that the quality of life issues are very important, but they're not all the same for every place in the city. And that we really need to address the quality of life where we can defi define and act on some of these issues. And I know that it's not just the information that was presented to us tonight, but it's around how do we make sure Vision Zero helps, you know, our pedestrian safety, our roads and safe streets. How do we look at housing and jobs? How do we create opportunities for upward mobility? And how um, particularly do we deal with code enforcement and the litter that we have in our city? The m emails that I'm getting primarily from citizens are saying these are some of the issues that they really want to see action on. And I know that most of us have talked about them in some respect one way or the other. So I think that this is a good way to start this discussion because we know that as our group, as a collective, um, I believe that we've been talking about how all of our committees are important to quality of life, and we're gonna have the opportunity to actually determine if we could work as a collective council with every committee that's functioning in this area to contribute to what I believe is our foundation, but something that we've got to really begin to work on for success. So we have the foundational knowledge of where we are today, but how do we, as a committee of the whole, with four functioning committees that have the ability to address this, make a real difference so that we can come back again and talk about what steps we need for a safer city? So I want to say that I'd like to ask every council member to have an opportunity to comment and question. And so I'm Chief and um, Mr. Rios, if you're prepared, I thought we might start with the Mayor Pro Tem and then go around the room and then come back around um, with Mr. Graham. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief Jennings, uh, Mr. Rios. Um, I think you'll hear from my colleagues a focus on outcomes um, and our, uh, the outcomes of our efforts and how we learn uh, from those outcomes to better our future efforts. Um, I have two questions. I think the first one is for, for both uh, Chief Jennings and Mr. Rios, and the second one is, is um, I think, for uh, Chief Jennings. I'll ask both of them. Um, youth and school violence. I think that is something that is really top of the mind uh, for our community. Um, we know school violence doesn't just get sequestered on school campuses. Um, what happens in our neighborhoods spills into our schools and vice versa. Um, but dealing with violence, the violence that spills in and out of our schools can provide certain intergovernmental hurdles um, on a continuous basis. Um, if there are certain hurdles, um, if there are actually certain hurdles, can you speak to them and how might we work uh, uh, more collaboratively with our colleagues across governments beyond just Mecklenburg County um, and CMS uh, to better address sources of youth and school violence? Um, that's for both. And then uh, I'll, I'll just ask it uh, to, to Chief, you want to? Yeah, oh, you want to answer that one first? Yeah. So I can, so just, uh, yeah, you're talking, so the question about the hurdles when it comes to addressing the youth violence and in schools and everything. I, I think that uh, a lot of the hurdles is the, um, the family structure as well, because there's only so much that we're, we're limited in what we can do with the, uh, when we address a juvenile offender. Uh, and also the, um, uh, as we know, the, the raise the age that occurred, at which uh, I'm not against the raise the age, but I do think that logistically we could have done better to prepare uh, for the raise the age because uh, at this point, a lot of the what we see with the juveniles is we do a juvenile arrest. They're released back to uh, a guardian or a parent, uh, and then they're back doing the same thing that we just arrested them for. So that's a that's a very difficult thing for us to be able to address on the police end of it. Uh, but also uh, a lot of things that I think we're doing a lot of really good things, not just within the police department, but a lot of the grassroots organizations that I think each and every one of you have worked with at some point or another uh, to be able to give youth another opportunity and uh, know that there's different directions that they can that they can go in. So uh, that's probably uh, the biggest hurdles that we see uh, within the police department. I think uh, the chief captured it pretty well. I would share based on my previous experience uh, before joining the city serving um, with a local nonprofit specifically with school aged youth uh, that one of the main challenges is actually having adults and specifically thinking of our grassroots nonprofit organizations be able to easily access schools. But that's a uh, multifaceted challenge related to the ability of individuals uh, to get background checks and be screened and appropriately uh, not interrupt the instructional day. Uh, I think if that is structured appropriately, it could be successful. Uh, the work that we've done through the Safe Charlotte grant to empower those grassroots organizations is noteworthy. Uh, they still face challenges, right? Transportation is a big issue in relation to getting young people uh, and then meeting them where they are. Again, if schools, uh, be rightly so, are managing their safety and want to be really strident about who comes in and out of their building, uh, that becomes a challenge. Thank you. Do you think that is a, a, a specifically a CMS um, a kind of partnership, or does it go beyond just with the uh, school system? I think the work that uh, we've done in tandem with the county and with CMS is exemplary that all the systems should be speaking to one another. Uh, Tracy, I won't steal Tracy's thunder. I know she's got a lot to share in time, um, but there's a lot of work that's been done to better understand where grassroots organizations are and how they all fit in. Um, and I can go on for a long time about nonprofit organizations and their ability to, to really undertake evidence-based models that we know are effective versus the work that we understand to be emotional and, and we think is doing good. We really want those groups to be able to do the things that we know will move the dial. Thank you. Um, and Chief Jennings, um, you know, uh, as we deal with uh, violent crime in, in particular, our community um, awareness is very important, the ability um, to kind of communicate back and forth between our organizations um, and the public, um, relationships with the media, uh, uh, to have transparent conversations with our, 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 our community as a whole is what we uh, depend on. 
And I, I believe that these relationships run the spectrum of concerning citizens with live streams uh, to local media outlets, to international uh, media outlets and everything in between. Uh, there has been recent concern um, about changes that are being implemented that are being seen as negatively affecting transpar transparency with the public. Um, of, of course, again, I have concerns about if, if there are problems with that, how we, how we continue to deal with that. Um, can council get briefed on these changes? Um, and can you speak to what these changes are and why they are deemed to be necessary? Yeah, very quickly, I can do that. Um, because I think a lot of what we're hearing out uh, through the public is incorrect as far as what we are looking at for the changes and how we've implemented those changes. So uh, quite frankly, uh, one of the changes is going to be the differentiation between public records and public information. And public records is what we're required by law to be able to provide, whether it's to the media, it's to anyone. Uh, and we have to be able to accommodate that and be able to have the staffing uh, to be able to fulfill those public records requests. Uh, public information is what we're talking about when uh, just a simple inquiry of why is there a police presence at this location or why is the helicopter flying over this neighborhood uh, and just a, just a request for information. So what I will tell you is that we get about 100 to 150 of those per day uh, that simply inquiries about uh, for public information. Uh, our public information office was getting to the point of becoming a call center for the media. Uh, we could no longer afford to do that. We're, we are a major city uh, and we are at, at a point to where I simply don't have the staffing to have people to be responsive immediately to simple public records or public information requests uh, such as we talked about earlier. So um, as we move forward, we try to look at ways that we could be more effective and also be more effective in the public records requests that are coming in. Like I mentioned earlier, we, to date we've had over 600 of those. Uh, I think we have about 100 that are outstanding right now. Uh, and I have to be able to fulfill those in a timely manner as state law or as the law requires me to do. Uh, so we haven't shut the media out at all, as, been, as has been said. Uh, what we are doing is redirecting where that information can be found on their own, particularly uh, ways that we are able to put that information out uh, actually through our social media content as well as through um, uh, the CMPD app, uh, different ways that we're able to say that instead of calling us and asking us for this information, here's how you can go get it. Uh, also, secondly, uh, the, there was some information about we're not doing press conferences anymore, uh, and that is entirely not true. What we were finding is we had a standing weekly press conference with the media, uh, and what we were doing was trying to create stories uh, to have the media uh, come in so that they would have access to be able to have just a, a, a regular press conference about topics that we came up with. Uh, then what we would find is we would find ourselves doing additional press conferences for specific cases and for specific uh, interests that we had uh, that we would get in front of and have those press conferences. I think from the date that we implemented this new process, uh, the first week we had four press conferences. and. Um, uh, so that is definitely not shutting out from doing press conferences, but what we're shutting out is the fact that we are uh, having to do a press conference every week regardless if we have information or not. Press conferences will be done as needed, uh, and so, so are interviews and um, uh, requests for other information as we can provide, but we simply don't have the staffing in a city our size to be able to take take in the, the enormous amount of requests that we get daily. I'm, I know that was a long answer. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, Mr. Jones and Chief Janice, maybe we can follow up on, on, on that um, offline. Be happy to. I think we yes. continue to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Chief Jennings, it will also be helpful for us to have the similar, if not the opportunity to join in on the discussion with the mayor pro tem and the mayor. Because what would be helpful for me is for you to give 
I would say an additional example of what it can look like because what I heard seemed as if CMPD curates here's what's going on and was having press conferences based on that information then multiple things were happening in the community so there were additional press conferences that were being held we unfortunately have seen an increase in crime we've seen where we've had high-speed chases if someone doesn't have the CMPD app how do our residents outside of the media sources know that something is going on along 77 or 85 and to be aware of this because that sometimes is a break in whatever programming is on to at, to at least let the community know if you can stay inside so can you give me an example of what it would look like if it's an immediate situation where everyone needs to stay inside for whatever reason how is that yeah. communicated yeah thank you um, let me just say this it, there's a perception that there's some drastic change that's going on with our uh, with us in the media uh, and they may perceive it that way but it's certainly not this is no different uh, then you're talking, asking the question, how does they get that information? We're not withholding information. We're still going to be providing that information, press releases. Uh, we're still going to be doing all of that so that the media can have uh, some data that they can report. Uh, but what we can't do is continue to take calls from every single uh, outlet on a regular basis and, and meet their deadlines uh, based on phone calls and emails. We will be putting that same information out, nothing's gonna change, uh, and we'll be able to provide the media with, with as much information as we possibly can, when we can. Some of the issue goes in when there are certain investigations or things that we can't release that we have to wait and get more data, but what we can release, we will be releasing. So that information's not going to be um, unavailable to the public. We'll, we'll make that available to the media, just like we always have, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, thank you for the presentations, thank both you. of you. It's nice to see the police office, excuse me, the police chief standing next to our equity uh, managers. Um, that means you have a question that, for him then. No, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to address equity tonight. So it's very, it's very befitting that uh, this, is this our first regular meeting with an ASL interpreter? So speaking of equity, so thank you for that, Mr. Rio. So I'm happy about that. Um, Chief Jennings, you said there were currently 280 officers down, is that correct? That's correct, yes. How are we addressing um, CMPD hiring from an equitable perspective? You and I talked about this before, and there was a report and taking a look at where we're losing minority officers. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that conversation. So are we doing anything intentionally to, to analyze that information? Is there, a, is there a possibility that your departments could work with one another and make some changes or what are we doing? Yeah, and, and some of that as we discussed, uh, it's, it's difficult because when we get those applications, we don't necessarily get the, um, the, the demographics in that sense because of uh, um, how those applications are processed and also we don't see like this, in, this individual is a black male or this individual is a Hispanic female. Uh, things like that. We go through the application process equally for everyone. Uh, now, what I can tell you, though, is our efforts uh, to recruit minorities, uh, the Hispanic and, and uh, African American uh, candidates, has been great, particularly with our HBCUs that were out in those communities or out in those schools. We just hosted a great event with uh, called Cops and Cleats that we started a year ago, where Johnson C. Smith just came in. Uh, with their basketball and volleyball team that uh, they had an experience day with CMPD. And from that, just that was just Saturday, 
we already have one of those athletes apply with our department and another one that's inquiring uh, and ready to apply. So little things like that, I know it sounds like they're, it's baby steps, which is okay, but uh, what we have to do is get into the communities and basically humanize who we are uh, and, and change our brand and our perception that we have in the community so that people have a genuine interest that this is a noble career and an honorable career and we have to keep fighting that fight to, to be able to change that. What percentage of our force is, is of color, black or brown? Right now we have about 17%. Um, I think our, our, our jurisdiction serves around 34% African American. Uh, I'm, and I'm sorry, you said of color. So we have about 17% African American uh, police officers, and then we have about 6% uh, Hispanic police officers. And actually, that number has uh, gone up over the last couple of years. So we're making progress there. Uh, but we're about half of where we need to be in the, on the diversity end. So there was a report, the report I'm talking about to my colleagues, and I'll share it with you, was kind of tracked where we're losing recruits. Yes. Right. So that's what I if, I if we can take a look at that again, if there's an equitable lens, we can look at that through, um, I don't know, questions on the uh, whatever. If, no, if we can take a look at. Yeah, that's a great question. We have um, and I, I just looked at some numbers today, as a matter of fact, uh, about uh, 1600 applicants that we have coming through uh, and we've hired, I think, about 170 of those. Okay. Uh, the problem where we're losing them, and that was my question as well just recently, uh, and where we're losing them is the, basically not through us, but we're losing them more through uh, the not following through with the, with the process. Uh, we'll have people get through half the process and then they'll drop out uh, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, or they just, there's no interest, they'll, they'll make the application uh, and then there won't be any follow-up after that. But we are making uh, a lot of strides in trying to ensure that out of, say, there's 1,700 or so right now, uh, we have people that are actually going back and reaching back out to those individuals to see, you know, where, you know, where did you lose interest or can, you, can we still have an opportunity to put you through the process? So, uh, but yeah, the majority of those are coming basically on the people that are dropping out of the process, not the disqualifications. So. Okay, thank you. We'll continue to look at that. Thank you. Now I have a, a question for Mr. Rios. The um, Alternatives to Violence Program. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned that the data is skewed. Um, so we know that I was a proponent for a local organization being able to, to get this contract. And one of the reasons that they didn't was because they didn't have the ability to capture data. So can you tell me what, what you mean when you say the data is skewed? Yes, ma'am. We had a full transition of the team in December. So the team that began the program in August of 2021 um, decided to transition out in December of 2021. I'm grateful to share that one of the individuals actually came back and is currently on the new team. Uh, but with that transition, Cure Violence Global recommended that we track as of February of 2022 to February of 2023, a full data set. Okay. So again, I'm a proponent for a local organization to have the contract. We talk about up upward mobility, but when there are opportunities for local organizations to benefit, you know, this is, you know, we, it, it wasn't granted because of data. That was one of the primary reasons. Um, so um, I would just say with, without the data, um, you know, can we truly support expanding the program to the same organization or should we consider another organization and then compare the two? Yeah, absolutely. So let me uh, mention quickly, sorry. Yes, Mr. Manager. So, uh, Mr. Rios, I, I think there are two separate teams that you're discussing right now in terms of one that transitioned out, but one that's been there the entire time. Correct. And I believe that's important to explain that there is one team that's doing the administration yes. and one that was boots on the ground, for lack of a better Correct. term. Correct. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. So there's a host organization, that's Youth Advocate Programs, a group that, um, that has, prior to coming on board with us to do this initiative, uh, actually got a contract with Mecklenburg County to do an advocacy program for youth going through the juvenile detention system. Um, that organization has remained stable throughout. The individuals that were hired to do the actual violence interruption transitioned out. So the organization has remained stable, that group is not. What I would share with you, uh, Councilmember Johnson, is wing yap after this current contract renewal. We renewed in this part, and mostly because we wanted to ensure stability for the beginning of the three-year evaluation that UNC Charlotte would be undertaking for us. Uh, but we will open all three sites up uh, for RFP so that other organizations can apply and potentially be selected for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. So the, the YAP stayed the same, so then the data is skewed. Um, but the organization stayed the same, so why then is the data skewed? So the data skewed because of the transition of the team. Okay. So the individuals that were actually inputting the daily logs related to their interaction with community members, once they leave, you're being provided service by a different team and you saw a significant dip during the month it took to get a new team established. And so for all of those reasons, Cure Violence Global recommended that we not begin uh, classifying data until February 22 to February 23. Okay, and then the last question is, is the three areas or the additional areas that were chosen, were those chosen based on, on data? Yes, so uh, I'll see if I can go back here. Because I would just, I, I would just want to lift up Sugar Creek in 85. Yeah, great point. Thank you for mentioning that. So again, um, let, me, let me speak to this, the maps first. So the circles you see on the map uh, increase by size based on the amount of incidents that have occurred in a particular area. So when you look at that top map, you see this real deep, this real big circle right there in the middle, that is Arrowwood and Nations Ford Road. Um, so a high level of incidents that are persistently occurring here. We knew that, it's a priority area for the city. It was acknowledged as such uh, initially. On the bottom there, you'll see two sets of circles uh, that are really pronounced over towards the top middle area around where it says Revolution Park. That's West Boulevard and, um, that's West Boulevard and Remount. And then past the yellow line that is 77, you see six, you see five circles, really six, that are fairly large. That is outside of Southside Homes. And so it's a clustering effect. So that data drove us to select these spaces. Sugar Creek in uh, 85 very much did come up. The challenge with Sugar Creek in 85 is, as I referenced earlier, those are not necessarily relational crimes. Those are often transactional crimes. So we see a different type of crime occurring in that sector, and I'm sure the chief could speak more to, to that. Um, but the nature of the crime makes the model not the best fit for that area. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so we want to talk about the relationship with that fine high school on Senior Drive, uh, West Charlotte. And so uh, you all knew that, right? Okay. <laughs> And so I want to talk about uh, the partnership. Is that weekly or monthly interaction with the faculty and the SRO? So can you just speak to that partnership, Chief? I'm not sure. We, as far as the SRO is concerned, it'd be daily. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there uh, we have the SRO in that. Is your question or not, but yeah. Just, I guess, just the conversation between the school and our partnership, was it on a weekly basis? But I yeah. think you clearly say SROs. On it, it's just like every every other school that has SROs. Uh, they're in there daily. Uh, if, they're, if that SRO is, or, or some schools have two SROs, uh, and if for some reason one calls in sick or whatever, we usually provide another alternative uh, uh, person to substitute and go into that school. So. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Chief, I'm, I'm a strong advocate for you hiring all the 280 officers. I guess one question, do we have all those vacancies in the budget for this year? Yes, and what, that's, that's a very good question because a lot of people have the perception that that money just sits there and goes away. Uh, that is not true. We, have a, we are able to supplement some of our needs throughout our department 
with what we call hire back program. So we have officers who have retired that we're able to bring back and they can only work a limited amount of time. So it's kind of, uh, it's not the ideal situation, uh, but we are able to use those funds for that purpose to be able to hire back uh, staffing to help us with our needs. Thank you, Chief. And just one last question for my, my friend over there, Frederica. On the ATV and, and Betis Ford Road Corridor, thanks to Councilman Graham for uh, using it as a pilot program. I think one question I will have, you mentioned there's program participations and there's a uh, mediation completed. So there have been some successes. So can you talk about some of the successes sure. that have occurred? Yeah, um, so 19 individuals are currently on the caseload. There are individuals that have tracked off of the caseload because they've met their individual goals. Each participant goes through a risk needs uh, review assessment uh, to evaluate where they are based on the goals that they set for themselves okay. in collaboration with the case manager, uh, which we call an outreach worker. And so, We've had cases where a young person went on to uh, go to Job Corps. Mm. Uh, we've had cases where individuals, uh, we, we actually had a couple of students that were on the football team and you're thinking, oh, they're on the football team, they're on the track to success. In fact, they were uh, one step out of the door frequently wow. and consistently getting into a number of challenges. Um, and so we've had some of this actually featured in the media where students that were really at risk we're able to connect with those individuals, those violence interrupters, those case managers, and it built a bridge to get them out of the challenges they found themselves in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right. Ms. Molina. I'm learning how to cut the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> First time I ever cut the mic on, you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor, uh, Chief Jennings, Federico, um, Chief Jennings, Chief Jennings, Chief Um, so, so many of my colleagues asked questions that I could have asked, and actually intermittently as they were speaking, I heard answers to some of the questions that I would have um, liked to kind of highlight, so I don't want to be redundant in my messaging. I actually, I, I like some of what I see. I'm, I'm very encouraged. Um, uh, Chief Jennings, thank you for your service to our community. Um, I, I definitely value um, our, our men and women who serve and protect us every day. So it, it, it makes a difference uh, to that, that you have a multi-pronged approach, even considering uh, the holistic approach of the, the actual servant, our public servants. So um, we want to keep them, and that, that matters, it means a lot. So I was happy to hear that. Um, just some high notes. Um, and I, I just got a little question maybe around um, the alternatives to violence initiative because it, it worried me as a constituent when I heard that through our alternatives to violence we were going to um, start kind of taking on some of the responsibilities uh, related to mental health. Um, and so how do we, is the only place that we're going to identify mental health needs, is that just going to be at the hospital emergency room or will that be like a response to a call or something like that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, are you referring to the CARES program, the response to mental health, the yeah. low level? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah no, no ma'am, that's going to be, um, that's going to be a responsive unit uh, out in the field and uh, we are, it's a pilot, so what's good about it is as we continue to look at it, one, we need to figure out where it's going to land. I don't necessarily think it well, I don't, I'm not going to get in trouble with the, the city manager. But, uh, oh, go ahead. Good trouble. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll Good trouble, him out. Chief. I, I'm not, I'm, I need to learn to cut my mic off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't necessarily think it needs to land within the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. Uh, however, I think we are the best fit to do the pilot uh, because we'll be doing the dispatch uh, and the response to that. So. Um, there, there are some concerns. I want to make sure that we keep all of our people safe when they do respond to these. So we have to make sure that we, they are going to the appropriate calls for service um, and uh, not putting them in any undue, unnecessary danger. But uh, yeah, but those are, unless I'm mistaken, uh, I know during the pilot we're looking at actually having them respond to calls for service, not just, not just to the hospitals. Also serving the involuntary commitment orders as well. Okay. So. Yes. Um, 
and then so I was looking and, and I was trying to make sure that I completely understood like I'm, I'm glad this is still up because I saw on one of the previous slides where there was a concentration of what looked like crime um, and of course as the representative from uh, East Charlotte I saw that there was an emphasis in our area and I'm wondering uh, if you can help me understand why we weren't, here we go, that's the. Yep, so this is violent crime that has occurred from um, a span between 2017 and 2021. Right. Uh, and this is specific to the Beatty's Ford Road area. So this is an example of a heat map okay. that we would use with. Um, okay, so this is just isolated to Beatty's. Yes. Okay, because yes. I'm looking, I'm sorry. Sorry, I should have went into more detail. You caught my attention right away. I was like, wait a minute, that looks like East Charlotte. And yep. I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna wonder like, why is this emphasis not? On the east side, okay, so I'm totally east side. Yeah. There, there are challenges that are faced in the east side, much like 85 and Sugar Creek, which was referenced earlier. One of the challenges we face around Central, um, right outside of the Eastland Mall property, mm -hmm. has been crimes of opportunity. Um, so what has often happened, and I'll defer to the chief to go into more detail if he so chooses, um, is individuals, specifically immigrants, that walk with money in their pocket because they often go unbanked. Um, getting taken advantage of and that perpetually comes up in that area, which is a high pri one of the high four high priority areas for the city. So it's not relational crime. And again, we want to ensure that we're picking the most perfect fit uh, for this particular model. Okay. And did you, did you want to speak to um, I can't, I mean, yeah, he's, he's actually absolutely correct on some of that. The uh, issue also is the transient of the individual victims that uh, people who are victimized, uh, they may be in our area for a short period of time, uh, but they uh, have a large amounts of cash on them. So when we start talking about crimes of opportunity, uh, that's why we often see uh, crime sprees that might involve uh, the Hispanic community where uh, we have a string of robberies and, and similar uh, suspect descriptions. So. Uh, those are the cases we want to work on and work on quickly to make sure that uh, we are apprehending those individuals who do that and prey upon our citizens. So uh, that's um, that's pretty a pretty good description of of that area. So. Okay. Thank you so much. You. All right, um, Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Ashmira. Oh gosh, I I do want to do a little bit of a time check. Um, if we, as we go around to this, we may not get to the disparity study today. All right, Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, my question is for Chief. Going back to the slide where you have challenges, you mentioned about your ongoing work with magistrates. Yes. Um, how can the council help with that effort? I know that's been ongoing and you have shared your frustrations publicly about uh, repeat offenders being let out with, uh, without any accountability. Um, so I just want to, I'm trying to understand the progress on that because this is an ongoing issue. Um, and what, what can be done to expedite uh, resolution here? Yeah, we, we've actually, I've had those conversations and uh, with uh, um, Judge Trosh as well as we have a scheduled uh, meeting that we are going to be, I'll be meeting with Judge Trosh, uh, the uh, District Attorney Spencer Merriweather, as well as Chief Magistrate Wanda Moore. So we have a meeting scheduled uh, coming up very soon. But what we are looking at is where can we make changes in reference to legislation when it comes to uh, the bail bond system. So uh, are we able to, there are some things that we've actually already had discussions that could improve the system uh, when it comes to bail uh, for individuals involved in very serious violent crimes. And we're going to work together on it. I don't want it to uh, appear that uh, I'm simply criticizing the magistrate's office in, in the system, but I'm going to be involved heavily in the, in the solution to this. Uh, and as we go forward, I think what you're going to see, particularly in the session early next year, will be some sort of legislation that will help us get to another level when it comes to uh, bond, bail and bond, so. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. 
Chief, I had a couple questions about some of the numbers you showed at the beginning of your presentation. Yes. And it would be helpful if perhaps you can root me into, you know, how we can see it within a context. So one of the numbers that you showed, there were 482 juvenile victims yes. so far this year. Yes. How does that relate to previous years? Is that an increase? Is it a, de is it a decrease? Like, where are we sitting with that? So all of that is interesting. And on both sides, both victims and for suspects, uh, juvenile suspects, we saw it, there was, um, when you look at 2019 numbers, because it's, it's 2020 and 2021 is kind of an anomaly with that, but we are actually looking at decreases from the 2019 numbers. Uh, so those numbers, actually, I, I do have those specifically here. And you're gonna ask a question that makes me put my glasses on. <laughs> so if we look at juvenile victims, uh, we had an increase in 2020 and 2021 where there were uh, 200, or 758 in 2020 852 in 2021, uh, 567 in 2019. So you see that number was was a little bit lower. So year to date now, and these are all year to date uh, that we're looking at, not for the entire year. Uh, we are looking at 690 juvenile victims, uh, 151 or 153 juvenile suspects, uh, and in um, so. But if you look year to date, 2019, we're looking at 207. And then 2020 and 2021 is 178 and 184 respectively. Uh, so um, we look better on some of those numbers, particularly on the firearms related violent crime with juveniles. Uh, uh, however, the uh, victims of violent crime, we're a little bit higher than we were in 2019 but we are doing better than we were in 2020 and 2021. So it's, it's, it's very difficult when you start looking at the mix between the last couple of years. But what I can tell you also is that what I see just uh, from a perspective uh, as the police chief is that it's not necessarily the numbers of the juveniles, it's the ages of them. When you see a 13 year old that is um, shooting uh, at another, at a 14, 15 year old, uh, or vice versa, uh, those ages to me are disturbing just how low they are, they are getting uh, within our communities. So that's a concern. Okay. And then I had a question about the ATV program. You had mentioned the, the two areas that you're looking to um, invest in along Southside Homes and then Remont Road and West Boulevard. Why do you see the opportunity to actually combine those two areas? I know they're proximate, um, but there's stretches that are pretty far apart. I'm just wondering if there's some underlying characteristics that are driving you to combine them. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. One of the things that we've heard from community members is, is what often happens uh, and West and Remount uh, ends up at Southside and vice versa. So um, they're very much connected areas of town um, and we've seen that reciprocally occur uh, on a fairly regular basis. And so we recognize that there is some, some unity there that can be worked with. Also, um, it's important to acknowledge that there are community organizations in both of these areas that have been incredibly vocal mm -hmm. about their desire uh, to see new approaches applied in their communities. Uh, at the Nation's Ward Narrowwood area, a group named SWAN at uh, West Boulevard, uh, which stretches you have the West Boulevard Neighborhood uh, Organization. And so there are groups that are very much committed to working in tandem with the city uh, and pioneering new approaches to solutions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bakari. Thanks. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, it's really hard to solve other people's issues when we uh, have inside our own house issues still existing within the department and again I you've seen some of the numbers there but you know I anecdotally have had a lot of conversations and 
morale is still at very rough levels. Recruitment and retention are directly impacted by that. So we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time in the city, but obviously we can we can we have to choose which thing we're gonna go all in on, particularly in a short term, to make an impact on. And it's my very, very strong opinion that if we focus our majority impact externally until we fin finish this stuff internally, we're gonna be in a rough spot with that. I think we need to figure out how to go back and make this an employer of choice in the way we started you know, talking about it five years ago. I think we need to figure out how to fill these positions and make sure that all the items that are remnants of the last three years um, are addressed for good and bad. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a great item for, that we could focus on in, on a short timeline like we have right now. But if we solely go out externally and put all of our emphasis on that, yeah, we'll, we'll make some differences, but we'll be doing it on a foundation that will lack the, the rigidity that we're going to need to do to, to have long term um, success. So I think and I think you'll see that even in the tactical decisions that are out there today, like um, how can we you know, manage and staff press conferences. I've, I've looked into it deeply. I believe that um, the approach they've taken makes sense. I think it probably could use a little tweak uh, around the edges of, you know, here are some SLAs or protocols by which this kind of information will send out this way, just another level of detail. But I think once that's done, uh, it'll serve its purpose now, but the broader context has to be understood, which is we can't keep our 911 call centers appropriately staffed. You know, this is a fundamental across the board issue that all resorts back to quality of life, and in this case, employer of choice. So I really think that's something that we should dive into deeply and provide the chief the support he needs to make sure that, you know, this entire police department knows we're going all in on that. Thank you. Uh, I had a conversation with Mayor Pro Tem over uh, the weekend, and there is an intrinsic tension that we need to confront between the actions that CMPD needs to take to keep us safe and the perception that their behavior is intrusive or hostile. I don't think we've worked it out. We're doing a lot of good work here, um, but, but, but there is a, a conflict, a fundamental conflict there. You need a strong presence. Uh, you, you need active engagement by officers. They're on the front line of our fight against violence, against harm that comes to our citizens, most of whom are, are in the African-American community. So I think we need to uh, continue to address that and always demonstrate our support for our officers. They need to know that we are, are grateful for their service, for the risks they take, for their engagement, and that if there is a bad officer, we will come down hard, but we will not generalize to other officers because of one person's behavior. So that's my general comment. Uh, Mr. Rios, I did have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, you mentioned that the timeline for data had kind of changed. Um, we went into the cure violence process based on data that we received about results they had achieved in other cities. So I'm just curious to know uh, what your latest estimate is of when we will have data that we can compare with the results in other cities to see how we're doing. Yes, sir. February 2023 uh, would, make, would mark one year and so we would hope to produce an annual report shortly after receiving that conclusive data. Because I don't need to tell you that right now the trends are a, a little bit concerning, right? The homicide rate back up to where it was year before last, uh, having been down last year, and the property crime increase, particularly this, uh, these robberies in stores. Uh, I've had reports of this personally in my district. Uh, they walk into stores, they fill up a cart, and they walk out. This is not San Francisco, it's Charlotte. So uh, there's an urgency uh, that we need to address. Uh, really appreciate everything you're doing. I'm not criticizing anybody, but uh, just recognize the situation we're in. Thank you. Graham, wrap it up for us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and thank you, Chief Jennings uh, and Federico for the presentation. I got two questions, some comments. I wanna thank the Chief for sitting with me for about, I guess about an hour last month, as well as with the city um, the police attorney uh, talking about the various issues. Uh, I'm very concerned, as I told the chief then, about um, waking up every morning watching the news in terms of what's happening throughout the city. Uh, it's throughout the city, it's just not in, 
in African American communities. Uh, we all are feeling the um, the pinch of increasing crime, and so it's really good to see both of you gentlemen here today because I think you both play um, significant roles and responsibilities to, to help us get the numbers down. M my first question is a relationship question in terms of the relationship between CMPD and Cure Violence on Bayes Fort Road, specifically related to the um, police department community engagement team. Are you guys working together uh, on some of those issues? Yeah. Uh, great question. So we're very mindful that the individuals that serve in the role of violence interrupter, outreach worker, and site director um, are considered credible messengers, meaning they, they have deep relationships with the community. So uh, the onus is not on them to communicate directly with the police. The onus is on me as the city representative that serves as a bridge uh, when communication needs to be shared. And so uh, I serve in that capacity and am able to get messages to and from uh, especially to our Metro Division Captain, Lucas Weath. Okay, and, and then secondly, um, Federico, I had a neighborhood meeting uh, with uh, neighborhood leaders this past weekend. We talked specifically about cure violence and they would like to kind of get to know the folks that are doing the work. So if you can work with me to kind of make that introduction. Absolutely, uh, so we have monthly events in the corridor to help introduce folks uh, to the model. Uh, we've had well over 300 individuals attend. Probably our biggest event was a Father's Day event in June um, where we inaugurated a plaque for the four individuals that uh, lost their life on the corridor during the mass shooting, uh, the Juneteenth mass shooting. And so we, con we continue to thank you for your presence there and, and for being able to speak. We continue to have those events in an effort to, again, behavior norm change. Um, and so we, yeah, I'd, I'd love but to put that at a more. higher level. Absolutely. If, if you can go to their meeting, which is, to. which is once a month, and it's the 12 neighborhood leaders across the Bayes Four Road corridor, just to kind of give them an update in terms of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and who are the people on the ground doing the work. I think that would go a long way. As long as I could bring Tracy Campbell with the county with me, I'd love to. You, you can bring Tracy and I'll come <laughs> along too. Um, the, the third question, and you already spoke to it in terms of the outcomes, right? I am. I'm going to support the million dollar uh, on the, on the um, agenda tonight. I think we talked about earlier about us growing the program and certainly growing it with federal funds and other money makes a lot of sense. Um, but the proof is in the pitting, right? And so whether or not this thing works or not. So I look forward uh, to getting the annual report next year sometime uh, March, April, uh, May, uh, in terms of what we're actually doing. I believe the two um, um, Additional um, locations for cure violence makes a lot of sense. And you're right, what's happening on Albemarle Road and I Sugar Creek is definitely different in terms of trying to prevent something before it occurs versus people out there just doing bad stuff, right? Which needs law enforcement interaction in a very targeted um, type of way. So I, I agree with all of that. Um, lastly, um, Chief, Chief Jennings, in terms of the recruitment of, of officers, I, I clearly understand, um, and let me back up. Uh, I, I have an enormous amount of respect for each and every officer on the force. Matter of fact, I'm going for a ride along Thursday night, so y'all pray for me. Um, I, I know you guys are going to take, take good care of me. I can't run because I have a bad knee, but I, 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 I really look forward to um, riding along with the um, the officer that's coming Thursday and Federico, I would love to walk the neighborhood with some of the team members from Cure Violence on Bayes Fair Road as well. I think you gotta be there to kind of, to see it. That being said though, as we recruit um, um, officers, uh, there was a recent report from the Anti-Defamation League about Proud Boys and others in, enter, going into police force. What measures do you have in place to ensure that as we recruit officers and officers who are on the force now that we got the best of the best and that we're not being infiltrated by some of these bad boys. Yeah, we've, we've uh, heard that same report. We, we're aware of that. That's actually been out uh, for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, I, I will start by saying this, that uh, there's no uh, perfect um, no perfect way to keep that out of our of any of our police departments across the country is but what we do is uh, a lot of the testing that related to pre-employment uh, with the implicit bias testing we look at uh, background checks uh, through social media uh, anything that we can actually look to determine uh, if this individual might be connected loosely or 
or directly to any agency like that. And it's not necessarily even just a, a relationship with an organization, a hate organization. Uh, it's, it's implicit biases that that individual may have personally as well. Uh, so as we go through our process and our, our steps that we take through pre-employment, uh, our hope is that we're doing everything that we can to be able to identify those factors. Uh, and if we uh, are able to, if we miss something and we identify it at a later date, then we will deal with that swiftly as well. Last question, and it's along the line of some of the other comments in reference to the to change in communication, um, yes. the relationship with the media. Uh, again, when I first, I read about it in the news, so I, and then I got a report from city staff, but uh, it's all in the presentation. Uh, and I think if we could have done a better job rolling it out, uh, certainly before the council should have known before the public knew so that some of the questions that are being asked now could have been asked before it got out there, but I'm, I'm hearing it, but I, I just put it out there that um, we, we got to have a, a department um, and, and under your leadership, I'm so proud of what you've done over the last two years. I think you know that uh, for sure, but um, transparency, I think now is an appropriate time to use that word around this size. Uh, it's, it's really important on this, on this topic. Uh, I understand the subtle change that you talked about, um, but it certainly wasn't reported that way out, and I think it's all yeah. in the presentation. And, and I appreciate that, and, and I will say that um, this, this was not, it wasn't expected to, as far as what we're dealing with, uh, but what I will tell you is it simply was an adjustment to immediate responses to try and answer questions that, uh, that we just don't have the capacity to do. And it was also simply going from the mandatory two-week press conferences to just doing as needed. We're not shutting any of that down. So to think that it would have reached this level, uh, this magnitude is, is uh, kind of surprising. To me. Certainly, if someone's doing something bad in the city, um, you're going to make sure everybody knows what's happening. Oh, certainly. Absolutely. That, none of that changes. None of that stops. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Rios. Thank you, Chief Jennings. We've had a really good discussion, so thanks to each council member. What I'm going to suggest is that we begin now with our disparity study and go to 715 so that we can get it done before we go downstairs for the council meeting. And so with that, um, Mr. Jones, if you would introduce this, and I think that the chair of the committee um, is Mr. Graham. Yep. So thank you, Mayor, members of council. And I'll just set it up, and then I, I think uh, Councilman McGram will do the, the formal introductions. So uh, we had a, a bit of a discussion earlier today about the, the purpose of tonight. And the, the purpose of tonight is to provide you with a, an update on the disparity study. It did go to committee a couple of times. It came out with a 4-1 vote. I think that's in the beginning of your, your pre-read. Um, and I think this is the key. What eventually will be asked of this body is for you to receive this framework, not approve it, not adopt it, just receive the framework. And then between that point and January of 2023, you will adopt policies that are related to the framework. But again, it is basically this keep going at it, staff. Um, when you, as early as two weeks from now, or whatever, whatever time it takes for you to just receive the framework that's going to be presented to the body tonight. All right. And, and I'd like to. Um, yes, Mr. Graham, if you, you've had this in committee and a recommendation coming out, if you could. Yes, ma'am, I'll, I'll keep it short, because I know that we're pressed for time. First, I want to acknowledge the staff, um, Sean Thomas, um, Steve Croker, um, Thomas Powell, and Tracy, the economic development team. Uh, this is something that we've been working on now between 18 and 24 months. Um, part of, of the disparity study is making sure that we have the legal basis to have a program based on race in a narrowly tailored way. Uh, we have an excellent um, consultant, Colette Holt, with Colette Holt & Associates. I reviewed her resume. I wish it was mine. Um, she, <laughs> she, she is extremely impressive on, on paper, but more importantly, in talking with her throughout uh, this process, uh, she knows what she's doing. Uh, she is a graduate of um, 
uh, Yale and um, uh, Chicago School of Law, which are uh, two top ten schools for sure, and have done a lot of work throughout the country, the city of Chicago, Austin, Nevada Department of Transportation, Houston. Uh, she knows the work really, really well, and I turn the program over to you and Steve. Well, thank you all very much, and good evening to you. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here in person. I promise to be brief. My understanding is that you all have received the uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to go through here, um, as well as um, other materials in a draft and the, the uh, final draft of the study. So uh, after I'm done, I believe uh, Stephen Coker will be uh, speaking for just a few minutes on um, what the next steps are. Let's hope we can get this to work. There we go. Okay. Very quickly, because it's important that, that everyone starts from the same um, framework about what the legal standards are that govern race and gender-based contracting programs. Uh, since 1989, these programs have been subject in federal court to what's called strict constitutional review. It is the highest level of judicial review that federal courts can apply. Um, race and gender-based programs have to meet two tests under the strict scrutiny standard. Uh, the first is that an agency like a city or a local government must prove that it has a quote unquote compelling interest in using the highly disfavored remedy of race-based government decision making. Um, in practice, this basically has meant um, do you have sufficient evidence that discrimination uh, still continues to infect the, the market for your contracts uh, such that uh, if you don't do anything, you will be a passive participant in a discriminatory marketplace. The second element of strict scrutiny is that any remedies that you adopt to address that identified discrimination must be, quote unquote, narrowly tailored uh, to the evidence that you uh, present. That's why the disparity studies are highly data driven, um, relying to a large extent on statistical evidence of disparities, because this is the framework upon which the federal courts insist. And I think certainly it's a fair thing to say that they have become ever more conservative on these issues over the last couple decades. There we go, okay. So just a quick note too about some recent legal developments. Um, I think it's important that people uh, get a sense of how hostile the courts really have become to these types of programs as you make decisions about how to move Charlotte forward uh, to ensure inclusion um, and equity in your contracting outcomes. Um, uh, the, uh, the black farmer cases, if any of you followed those over the last few months, um, we have lost every single one of those now, um, and one would have thought that there could not be uh, a stronger record of discrimination by the federal government itself uh, than against uh, black and indigenous and Latino farmers for many, many decades. Um, but unfortunately, so far, three trial courts have ruled against the program and a nationwide class action out of Texas, where I now live, um, of white farmers has been um, certified. Um, so that, that, that case is basically on hold. The Biden administration in the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, sort of threw in the towel about it to some extent um, and now is going to allow for um, any farmer that is financially distressed uh, to apply uh, for the money. Uh, we also lost uh, the cases against the um, uh, COVID relief package for small uh, restaurants that were owned by disadvantaged uh, and socially economically disadvantaged individuals, including veterans. That was struck down. Um, Oregon and uh, Colorado were two states that tried to have COVID relief funds that were focused on minority businesses, and those were struck down. So I sort of feel like I'm the skunk at the party all the time now, um, but I, I do think it's important that, that decision makers and leadership understand uh, the, the standards under which uh, we, we labor at this point. So the objectives of the disparity study really were fourfold. Um, certainly and perhaps most uh, importantly, to provide the city a legal defense if a program uh, based on the study um, is challenged in court. It's also important to be sure that your study um, fits within the constitutional parameters that the federal courts will impose. Uh, we think it's also important to provide policy and program recommendations. A disparity study is a chance for you to hear from your customers, so to speak, about their experiences uh, with the city of Charlotte. And then lastly, uh, we try to use the study as a tool to educate policymakers, stakeholders, and, and other interested parties about what the legal and economic issues are so as to be able to build consensus for these programs going forward. 
Here are the uh, data uh, sources that we used um, and uh, the methods. So you can see there we had quite an extensive um, uh, pool of quantitative data, um, including city uh, vendor records. And let me take this moment to say thank you, thank you to Steve and Sean and, and the rest of the staff for all of the work that you did in going and collecting these contract records. Um, this is the hardest part of a disparity study. Many studies don't do a very good job of, of this. and. Uh, uh, been challenged in court, and it's been a problem. So thank you all. You were you were great clients. We love we loved working with you. Um, and then you see the other uh, sources that we use there. We also did collect qualitative or anecdotal information um, through business owner um, uh, and stakeholder interviews. We also did a, did a survey. I'm not sure why that bullet's not on there. Um, but we also interviewed uh, city staff to get as much input as we possibly can from all the uh, factors uh, in the community. I'm a little too close to this. There we go. Okay. So here are the elements in the study. This just basically follows along with the table of contents. So I won't spend any time on that. Um, but you can see there how the study is actually organized. Come on. There we go. I think you have to point it like right there. Okay. Um, so what did we find? Um, well, we first interviewed uh, 93 individuals and obtained 490 survey responses. So from a disparity study standpoint, this is extremely good coverage. There was a lot of interest in the study uh, and in the city's program uh, throughout the community. So that, that was great. And again, thank you to the staff for doing such a great job in helping us uh, to get uh, a good turnout, as well as our local sub uh, partners. Um, generally, people said that your program works well and creates opportunities. They thought it was very, very important. Uh, there was pretty clear unanimous agreement amongst minority and women firm owners that contract goals remain necessary to ensure that they get work. Uh, many uh, uh, certified firms told us that for, uh, larger firms that will use them on contracts with goals, both for city projects as well as NCDOT or some of the other programs, don't even solicit them when there are not goals. So maintaining contract goals was considered to be paramount um, in ensuring uh, access to uh, fair competition. Um, mostly the prime vendors uh, said they were able to meet the city's goals and found them reasonable. Some scopes were more, were more difficult than others. Some industries are more specialized. Uh, engineering firms uh, said they faced particular challenges um, in that regard. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of complaints about uh, credit uh, toward, uh, towards goals being limited to only um, the Charlotte um, uh, area, which, which severely restricted the pool of firms from which they could choose. Many of the uh, participants suggested trying to unbundle, um, that's kind of the, the procurement term these days, or make contracts uh, less complex or smaller, uh, so that smaller firms of, of whatever ownership um, were able to bid on them. Now, more technical support was another request. Uh, this is things like helping with estimating, putting proposals together, how to invoice the city, how to access decision makers. All of that knowledge about what it takes to be a successful business person, uh, people wanted more support from the city. Um, minority and women firms, uh, particularly in certain industries, really want to become prime vendors. I always stress to people, these programs are not only subcontracting programs. Um, if anything, the discriminatory barriers that we always identify across the country um, are harder for firms that want to serve in a prime vendor role than they are for subs. So uh, you'll see in a second some of our recommendations really do focus on trying to create more opportunities for MWBEs to serve as prime contractors with the city. Uh, your current electronic uh, uh, system is effective. Um, but many of the firms complained that they didn't think there was sufficient monitoring of contract commitments during performance. Many of the MWBEs would like to have more networking events uh, with city staff and large <coughs> vendors, um, especially some focused on particular industries. A lot of support for a mentor-protege uh, program, and I believe some of that is already underway. And then unsurprisingly, um, assistance with obtaining capital, surety bonding, um, and insurance uh, were also uh, requested so that firms were able to take on larger and more complex projects. Oh, where's the magic sweet spot here? Oh, ah, there we go. 
push down or up. Push down or up. All right, that's what we'll do. Much better. Okay, so you can see here what else uh, we did in terms of our, of our data collection. That was our uh, anecdotal or qualitative data. Um, but turning to the utilization of minority and women firms on city projects, uh, we uh, examined uh, fiscal years 2015 to 2020. You see there we started with um, a final contract data file of about 750 prime contracts with um, a total of, a, of over a billion dollars, and there were about approximately 1,100 uh, subcontracts associated with those prime contracts, and you see there the total as well. Uh, one of the legal requirements of strict constitutional scrutiny is that a local agency must tailor its program to its actual contracting marketplace. This is an empirical question. Um, it might sometimes turn out to be that it's the local jurisdiction or the uh, market area uh, that the census uses for other purposes, but often it does not. Um, and in this case, uh, based on where almost 75% of your actual dollars were spent, um, uh, your geographic market is the state of North Carolina um, and York County, South Carolina. Uh, we also had to determine what the product or industry market was for the city, and we found that there were 137 sub-industry codes. Uh, NAICS stands for North American Industry Classification System. Uh, it is the taxonomy that the Census Bureau uses to categorize industries, so that's really a lot of codes. Um, so the city buys a lot of different um, goods and services across many other sub-industries. So what was the utilization of minority and women firms uh, in those uh, geographic and product, ma uh, product market areas, excuse me? You see there that minorities and women received as a total um, a little bit over 12% of the city's contract dollars. And this does include prime dollars and subcontractors. Uh, and you see there um, how that's all broken out with about 87.9% um, uh, going um, to the other, uh, to non-MWBEs. Um, let me just note that um, for our purposes, um, minority women, so black women, um, were counted as, as minorities uh, for their specific racial group. So when we say women in the study, um, at least from a quantitative standpoint, we are talking about uh, white women. Um, if you add all those numbers up, they don't add up perfectly. It's because of rounding. I mean, we can take it and we have it in, in, in the um, st uh, statisticians' files out to about eight decimal points. But that makes it very, very clumsy to put on a slide. Um, but you can see all of that um, in, the, in the report for those that like that kind of thing. Um, here's just a nice pretty pie chart. Thanks to Sean for making that happen. I didn't know how to do that. Um, and it just gives you a visual of that same data. And now we have bar charts. So lots of different ways to see the same information. So that's the utilization of MWBEs on city prime contracts and associated subcontracts. We also, as part of the strict scrutiny analysis, have to look at the availability of ready, willing, and able firms to provide uh, those 137 industries that the city buys from in that geographic market. So you can see how it's, it's a sort of an, an iterative process of constraining um, the marketplace. Um, so here's what we found in terms of the availability of minorities and women in those market areas. Um, MWB is a little bit over 13% as a total. You see there the rest of it broken out as well. Um, and do note that that does include firms that are not um, certified. Um, we, it's, the vast majority of them, of them are, but we try very hard to get as broad a net as possible. That's what the courts require. Um, and so uh, we do have some other data sources that we can use to find firms that may be woman or minority owned but are not certified by the state hub office. So here's a nice pie chart, same information. Bar chart, same information. So now we have our utilization and we have our availability. And those are the two pieces that you need in order to perform disparity testing. And the legal standard is whether there are large and statistically significant disparities between the utilization of MWBEs and their availability to perform on city contracts. Um, there are some rules about this. We did, um, our statistician did apply um, statistical significance tests. 
um, as well as substantive significance, which just means is it under 80 percent. There's a lot of discussion about this in, in the report. I'm happy to go into it in more detail if, if anyone um, is interested. But you see there what the actual disparity ratios are. Um, the disparity ratio for blacks is substantively significant. It is under 80 percent. Um, white women is just kind of at the edge. Um, one thing people should not take from this is that if the number is um, between 80 and 100 percent that there are no problems. Um, it just means that you don't have substantive significance, but you do still have uh, a disparity and those groups have not yet achieved parity on city contracts. So here it is again in, an, in a nice little bar chart. More bar charts. So one of the things that, that we do in, in our studies, because we think it's important for an agency like the City of Charlotte that has had uh, a, a successful program for some time, is to do a concentration analysis. Because the numbers that I just showed you are overall, they're aggregated, that's everything rolled up uh, together. But one of the things that we want to explore is how concentrated that participation is amongst different groups and amongst different industries. And most of the time what you do find is that, well, overall, let's say, um, a group might be approaching parity. Once you start to unpack that, you see patterns that I think are important for decision makers and how you might want to um, move forward um, uh, in, the, in the future. So certainly one of the things that we found, which is not a surprise, it's usually what we find, um, is that contracts, uh, dollars received by minorities and women are much more concentrated in a small subset of codes than for non-minority firms. That minor, non-minority firms are kind of generally spread out, sort of like you know, jam across a, a biscuit, maybe. I guess I must be hungry. Um, whereas the, the minorities are, are more concentrated, you know, little dollops of stuff. Um, because if there were parity, the share of dollars in any code that can, should equal the same across groups, but that's not what we found. That in fact, um, we had disparity ratios that ranged from 0.5 for Asian firms, which was heavy civil construction, to 263 for black firms in trucking. So what you can take from that is that African American firms, yes, they got a fair number of contract dollars, but it was concentrated in a much smaller subset of opportunities. And this, I think, matters for what you want to do as you're moving forward with your program. Where do you want to put resources? What kind of outreach do you want to do? How do you get a broader swath of firms to share in the wealth that is the city of Charlotte and get that to be more equal amongst the groups and amongst the industries so that all the black firms aren't all stuck in trucking and nobody's getting any work in heavy civil, which is really where the money and the profit is. So you, that, that slide's an attempt to, to condense a, a pretty lengthy, um, intense analysis down. So I, I'm happy to try to answer any questions people might have about that. So that's con uh, Charlotte's actual contract data and availability and disparity results. But we also wanted to include an economy-wide analysis um, because this is especially useful um, in evaluating the effectiveness of any race or gender neutral program that you might um, adopt. Because although, yes, there is some contracting affirmative action um, in, the, in the area, um, as a general matter in the economy, it's not much. And it doesn't really impact very much. So we used two Census Bureau data sources for this piece of the analysis. One is the American Community Survey, which looks at individual entrepreneurs. And there we found that uh, minorities and white women uh, formed fewer businesses and earned less from the businesses they do form than similar white males. So we saw big disparities there. We also looked at the annual business survey, which looks at firms, ACS is people, annual business survey is businesses. And again, we saw very large disparities between the receipts of um, M and WBE firms compared to non-MWBEs that were comparable. So what we take from that is that in the overall economy um, in the state of North Carolina, that minorities and women are not receiving equal opportunities throughout uh, the, the, the wider economy to participate. We also took a look at what's becoming a really pretty robust uh, body of knowledge about credit discrimination. Um, and there, there's lots of uh, information from the Federal Reserve Board about um, discrimination in accessing business credit. And of course, you know, it's hard to run a business without credit. So obviously, these are the types of things that impact the ability of firms uh, to have full and fair opportunities to compete for your work. 
So uh, turning to our anecdotal um, uh, findings, you see there we uh, did business owner interviews, and these are some of the things that people told us. Um, unfortunately, that minorities and women still suffer from biased perceptions about their qualifications and their competency, that being an MWBE can still be a stigma, that they are considered to be less good. You know, the old you know, thing about you, know, you have to work twice as hard and be twice as good to get half as far. Um, that certainly does seem to still be um, a problem for, for many people. Um, many of the MWBEs had trouble accessing the type of networks that you need in order to be successful in business. Um, some uh, minority owners uh, recounted um, being subject to blatantly hostile racial environments, um, as did many women um, still ex uh, experienced gender bias um, and barriers in their business opportunities. Survey responses were pretty much the same, um, demeaning comments, stereotypes, um, you know, all the kinds of things you can imagine, and there, there's the lengthy con uh, comments, quotations from what people told us um, about that. Um, access to information, capital, bonding, same sorts of problems. Um, again, MWBEs were often not solicited for contracts without goals. Um, and I think importantly from a capacity standpoint, many of them said they certainly could do more work if they could get it, that they could rise up to meet opportunities if opportunities were offered to them. Because we sometimes hear, oh, well, you know, the MBEs, they're little, they, none of them have any capacity to do anything. Well, they might if you gave them a chance um, and they got a chance to grow. So those are our findings. Um, and turning now to our recommendations, we divided those into two basic types. The first are race and gender neutral measures that would, implement, um, that would assist all firms. Um, and these are increasingly important as the courts uh, are starting to attack uh, race-based programs. So I, I really do urge people to focus on some of these. Um, one thing that a lot of uh, uh, business owners requested was some type of long-term procurement forecast so they could plan so they could uh, get, uh, get into the networks, they could make the relationships before the solicitation comes out, because by that point, it's too late. So they want to know what's coming up. Um, the, the city does have a quick pay program uh, currently, and we're suggesting uh, uh, extending that to all industries. Um, yes, of course, it's a particularly problem in construction, um, but it's a problem, period. And let, let me say right here, right now, that we always got paid on time. No, no, no problems there. So let, let me be real clear about that. Um, I also knew that if I really had a problem, that, that I got some, some folks to run interference for me, which most businesses aren't going to have. Uh, we certainly uh, suggest that you expand your supportive serv services offerings. People requested things like um, assistance with networking, paperwork. A um, lot of discussion about supporting the needs of more mature firms. Um, there's always a lot of emphasis on startups. Get a business plan, get a bank account, get a website. And that's, that's important. But what can you do to help the firms that are more at that mid-level step it up to be able to reach for those larger contracts? Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion and requests for uh, programs to assist firms to finance um, their businesses. Technical assistance, more capital access, and bonding were requested particularly for construction firms. And there are some good uh, programs out there across the country. Let me just be real clear, we don't do them, um, but I, I know of, of some that my other agencies um, could certainly recommend to you. Um, we do believe that you have a, a solid basis to continue to implement a narrowly tailored race and gender conscious MWBE program. Um, with the, the, the quantitative and the qualitative findings um, do support the ability to continue to set um, annual and narrowly tailored contract goals. Um, we're suggesting that you use the availability estimates in the study to set those goals um, and that, um, uh, that, that that means that your annual aspirational goal would be about 13% which is just an overall target for city spending. It really has nothing to do with what goals might actually go on a particular contract. Also helping to use the study data to set contract goals. We are suggesting that you not include SBEs on contracts that have MBE, WBE goals. Um, it's, it complicates things and, and frankly it cannibalizes the uh, participation of minority and women-owned firms. If there aren't MDEs or WBEs that are available, you know, fine, SBE goals are, are fine, but, but we're certainly suggesting not, not adding that on um, because we want to be sure that minority and women-owned firms 
um, that are certified uh, have the most opportunities possible. Um, we're saying, certainly suggesting expanding your pool to actually fit your market area, which I really do think is a legal requirement, um, and that's to the state of California and New York County, South Carolina. Certainly, so North, Carolina. North Carolina, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have my mother's family is from South Carolina, so sorry. Um, um, the uh, uh, CBI program administration policies and procedures we think could use um, some refresh. Um, certainly suggesting that you use uh, the industry codes in the study for goal setting and reporting, not NIGP codes. This is a little down in the weeds, perhaps, um, but it makes it very difficult if you're using two different coding systems uh, to manage the program. Uh, we are suggesting that you allow minority and women prime firms to count their own self-performance towards meeting a contract goal. You know, as I mentioned before, this is one of the most difficult um, it, uh, areas to, to make progress is helping MWBEs to be prime contractors. Um, the federal programs are set up this way. This is certainly, I would say, the national best practice, and so we're urging you to think um, about that. Um, we suggest only giving people credit for participation in work in which the firm is certified. Give credit. Now, they may get certified later. That's all great. Um, but at the time people are submitting their plans, we think um, you, should, you need to tighten that up a little bit. Uh, we're suggesting um, revising your good faith effort standards um, and adopting some flexible remedies uh, for program violations. Um, a new mentor protege program, which I think may be partly in the works, um, is another um, idea that we think would be very helpful. And then lastly, two, two points, um, suggesting making um, a, a conscious set of, of conversations, at least, if not decisions, about how you want to measure success. Um, you know, obviously the old management saw what get, what's gets um, measured is what's important, but there are different ways to think about success in these programs. Obviously meeting the goals is, is obviously one of them, but you know, are you getting more firms in the program? Are, work, are firms doing a wider variety of work? Are more firms getting a wider variety of work? Are people growing? Are they getting prime contracts? Lots of different ways to think about it. But our suggestion to clients, frankly, is that they, they have some focused discussion about what success means to you all um, as the leaders. And then, of course, conduct uh, regular program reviews. This is a constitutional requirement. Um, and, and actually, Charlotte's been quite good about doing that on a regular basis. So that's all I have. Steve, you want to, have you got anything else that you wanted to say? Or talk, my, my good friend Thomas here. Uh, we're just going to quickly skip to the schedule for everyone's awareness and then open us up for questions. Mayor? So thank you very much, Ms. Hope. Thank you. And Thomas, thank you as well. I'm going to suggest that um, we have the schedule, and that schedule allows for time for discussion. We've had the um, example of disparity study. So what I'd like to do is um, ask the council members if they had um, questions that we needed to respond to, that if we can't get them all out verbally tonight, that you email them to um, the chair or, or, or to Tracy Dotson's office so that we can do this. And because I know that Ms. Holt has a flight and we also, it's a little bit after seven. So I um, would like to um, have the ED chair and um, be able to wrap this up. And I also want to recognize members of our CBI um, advisory committee as well. Ms. Mitchell, I don't know the other. Um, folks that are joining you, but she's been in this doing this work a lot and, and your contributions are invaluable. You know that, I hope. So thank you. Um, so with that, if we really want to get downstairs by 715, I'm just going to turn it over to Mr. Graham and follow up with um, Mr. Driggs and then we'll go downstairs and have this. But please get your questions if either to Mr. Graham or Ms. Dotson, Mr. Driggs, so that we can um, be ready for September 26. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I think that the next steps on the on the slide speaks for itself. So that's uh, that's my parting remarks, and uh, the mayor has instructed you what you can do in terms of there's additional questions. Thank you, All right. Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. I will just acknowledge that I was the dissenting vote in committee. Uh, we don't have time now uh, to go into the whys and wherefore, so I will try to communicate to council in the time until uh, the acceptance what concerns I had about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, 
I think for the good of the group, we'll go downstairs and let's see if we can really start at 7.15, no later than 7.15 for the meeting, okay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.
I want to call the September 12, 2022 City, Charlotte City Council business meeting to order. I want to say welcome to all of you that are joining us in the chamber, as well as those that are joining us um, virtually. Um, thank you for giving us your time and attention on the first weekend of football which you're probably likely ready to do Monday night instead. I can hardly <laughs> wait to see the video that they do this year. Um, so um, as we call to order, this is significant because we are having our first meeting with our newly elected council members. Um, and I'd like to begin um, with introductions. And we'll begin with um, the Madam Clerk. Stephanie Kelly, City Clerk. Happy Monday, Dimple Ajmira at large. City Council James Mitchell at large. Renee Johnson, District 4. Good evening, Lawana Mayfield, City Council at large. Marcus Jones, City Manager. By Lyles, and I serve as mayor. Braxton Winston at large and serving as mayor pro tem. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Ed Driggs, District 7. Tarpa Carr, District 6. Dante Anderson, District 1. Tina James, Deputy City Attorney. All right, thank you. We begin our meeting with an invocation or an expression of inspiration, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation is intended to solemnize our deliberations. We recognize that there is um, diversity of religious thought in our community, including those without a religious faith. Tonight, Councilmember Mayfield will give her um, invocation or remarks and if we can after um, Councilmember Mayfield if we may stand and rec be and have our Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, I will be standing if anyone cares to join me because I will be reading brief comments from Ephesians 4 11 to 13. Holy One, I thank you for every individual at this meeting. Your word tells me that you gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip your people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So during this meeting, I pray that we come under that same purpose to build up your people until we reach all unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of you. Amen. 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 We'll turn for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to now recognize Councilmember Driggs for a um, thoughtful. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to mention I, I'm offering the following comment as a matter of personal privilege and not as a message from Council. Last Thursday on September 8th, Queen Elizabeth II of England died at the age of 96. The death of the British monarch is of some historical significance to us as we are the Queen City of Charlotte in the County of Mecklenburg. It is also relevant to our city because of our large and vibrant British community and to our country because of the Queen's staunch advocacy for the transatlantic alliance during the terms of 14 American presidents. <clears throat> More than anything, however, it is relevant to all of us because of who the Queen was and her place in the world during her 70-year reign, starting as a princess during World War II through tumultuous times for her realm, the monarchy, and her family she performed her royal duties faithfully, unselfishly, with unwavering dignity, courage, and grace. She never lost sight of her commitment to her people and the trust they placed in her. Her place as one of history's great monarchs is assured, and we should join our British neighbors in Charlotte, our British allies across the sea, and so many others around the world in mourning the passing of a queen, the likes of whom we will not see again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Um, now we're going to begin the business portion of our agenda, but we start first, and we start first with the city manager's report. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. I believe at the, the dais you have my 30-day report in front of you. Again, trying to build a bit on uh, our action briefing, trying to have information before you so that as we move forward, the, the council members 
I have a general understanding of what would be the next uh, big topics. So we did have the safety initiatives tonight as well as this, the disparity study overview. Outside of the zoning meeting on the 19th, our intentions are to come back on the 26th in the action briefing to give you the arts and culture update, something that we talked about, uh, I guess, last back in August, as well as it would be time to have a CTC, the Charlotte Transportation Center update also. And then uh, after the uh, a strategy session or a all hands on committee meeting on the 3rd, we have the 10th, which would have an opportunity for the housing trust fund recommendations, as well as, and this is similar to uh, what I discussed earlier with the um, disparity study, getting caught in between two different councils. We did have an equity and governance framework that came out of committee that was discussed at a strategy session. And again, it's not an action, but an opportunity to talk to the council at the um, action briefing. Then lastly, it's been a while since we've had the American Rescue Plan Act update, so not uh, necessarily that we have a number of items. There are some things that are, are being discussed, but we want to make sure that we're communicating with the council. So in terms of just the, the outlook, those are some of the topics that have been uh, brewing that we'd like to make sure we discuss with the council. And, and that's my 30-day memo. Mayor, what, what I'd also like to provide during this time, if it's something that council would need, we have Sean Heath, uh, the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Services. Sean, I hope I'm not surprising you. Uh, if, if needed, uh, because there is a, a, a big item, pepper tree, on the uh, business portion of this uh, agenda, if there needs to be any additional discussion or um, Sean a briefing um, both the new council members or reminding some of the previous council members, Sean is available. That is at the will of this council. All right, that's thank my you. Report. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, I'd like to add two things to the manager's report. On, 19th, on September 19th for the city council zoning meeting, I will be out of town and Mayor Pro Tem Winston will be conducting that meeting. And also October 3rd is the first um, strategy session meeting where we will be having the new schedule with committees and the committee's memo assignments will come out to everyone tomorrow. And so you'll get that in the morning. So thank you everyone. For that, and um, I, Mr. Jones, I wasn't sure if you were saying at the time for the agenda item, or if you'd like to have Mr. Heath right now review at address any questions. Well, I'd, I'd like to have him available to you now if there are any questions before right. you even get to that item. All right. So. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Questions, um, Mr. Heath? Please come down, and if we would look. All right, I'm thumbing through my agenda book, Mr. Heath, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, we had sponsorship first and a number of other things. Number, number nine. Number nine. Here we are. Yep. Number nine. No, number nine? Yeah. Number yes, nine. nine. No, yep. got it. Thank you. All right, so let's just go through. We're going to move this item up on the agenda now so that we can have this, this questions answered and while it's fresh, we're able to have a conversation about it. So um, this is agenda item number nine. Um, it is a business item for a naturally occur occurring, occurring, I cannot talk today, <laughs> affordable housing preservation and rental su subsidy support requests. And the action is to approve an $8 million allocation of funding from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund provided by the American Rescue Act of 2021 to Central NOAA LLC, an affiliate of Ascent Real Estate Capital for the acquisition and rehab of Pepper Tree Apartments. B, to approve a naturally occurring affordable housing rental subsidy program reimbursement request to allocate funds over a 20-year period for 44 new long-term rental subsidies at Peppermint Peppermint. <laughs> Pepper tree apartments for households earning 30% and below the area median income and see authorize the manager to negotiate, execute these contracts for these items it's, um, between Central NOAA LLC and the Housing Collaborative, formerly known as Social Serve. 
All right, with that, um, why don't we go ahead and start motion with- Motion to adopt and approve. A motion, thank you. So to, move. Second. We have a motion to adopt and approve. So now we'll open it up for discussion. Um, I think it might be best if, Ms. Anderson, would you like to start us off with any questions regarding the item for Mr. Heath or the manager? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I had some time to spend with you earlier today, so I exhausted the, the majority of the questions that I had for the gentleman. I would say, as this property is adjacent to District 1 and was formerly in District 1 before the rezoning, um, the, the population for naturally occurring affordable housing is, is something that the district definitely prioritizes. Um, and I believe that this is a, a good opportunity for us to continue to prioritize that with the funds that we have available for, from the federal government. So thank you. No questions. All right. Mr. Bakari. Yeah, I, I just make a comment. I'm largely supportive of this effort. Um, I think that the folks doing it are very good and they think outside of the box. I think that we um, did not fully capitalize on an opportunity on our side to maximize the outcome of this. It, and we had had small group discussions. I had brought forth what I think we need to be focusing on here, which is Noah, great, outstanding. This developer and, and <clears throat> leader's uh, commitments towards doing workforce-related training, finding opportunities with wraparound services, great. But as long as we continue to make that a line item in a spreadsheet and not something that's codified and woven into the critical path, it will always be a hobby. So I, 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 there was a perfect opportunity here for us to say, okay, X percentage of these units cannot be um, filled unless you go and get the workforce provider for training, get the job that that person's gonna move into, get the transportation, get the food, clothing, all the wraparound services where these units become a place where folks go, are upskilled, and then they move on and they open up for someone else. And as long as that's a, a, a a side note goal and not something directly tied to the financial benefits we're pumping into it, it won't be achieved at the level it could be. So I really, I'm still going to support it tonight because I think on the, on the whole it's very good and what we need to be doing more of, but we need to start stepping up and innovating and doing our part to make these outcomes happen. So I'm hopeful that we don't have another missed opportunity like this on our end. That's an excellent point and I hope that everyone recognizes we're going to plan to have a summit on how do we combine those kinds of services with the work that we're doing in terms of what we're doing with the next 50 million bond. As a reminder, please come out and vote to support that because that's going to help us figure <coughs> out what we can do differently um, to make economic mobility um, and upward mobility matter along with housing. And now I recognize Mr. Driggs. So I agree that we have uh, the potential to refine and, and maybe to maximize our advantage but uh, this is something we're doing we're not just talking about it we're doing it uh, we're in relatively uncharted waters when it comes to NOAA it's a very important priority for us because NOAA's are the way we protect against gentrification NOAA's are the way that we maintain uh, existing affordable properties and defend them and uh, I really appreciate the participation of, of the county and, our, and the private funders in this structure that we have. Uh, again, we, we will keep working on this, but I think we just need to do some. And uh, we, we need to see how we go, what the experience is, what the position is of our partners in discussions. And here is the thing that we can actually complete. So uh, I'm going to vote for it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as Vice Chairman of the Affordable Housing Great Neighbors Committee, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I, I talked to all the stakeholders involved in it. I think this is exactly uh, what we need to do. I think Mr. Dregs and Mr. Bakari are right. Uh, obviously, there's room for improvement, but we're, we're really taking a giant step forward. We're pinning housing on the street right now to build a new unit. It's 18 to 24 months, so if we can preserve what we got. Uh, and enhance it uh, and keep it in play, uh, I think that benefits the communities um, tremendously. So I'm very supportive of it, and uh, I will be supporting it. 
Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, th thank you. I, I agree, um, Mr. Bakari's uh, statement and and position is is exactly where I think City Council does its best work on the policy um, uh, outcomes uh, uh, perspective. Um, I, I think it's a uh, something that we should continue to think about, uh, figure out how to how to include that um, in our policy language. Um, I often, when I'm talking to the community about how we use, um, whether it's our uh, housing trust fund dollars or these um, uh, COVID relief dollars uh, that, that we get, um, city council and, and the city is really, you know, looking at this like a Swiss army knife. Um, and, and I really do think we add a, a tool um, uh, to, that, to that knife um, year after year, um, uh, project after project. Uh, I, 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 I think we should not overlook the fact that for 20 years this will provide 44 new long-term rental subsidies for households earning 30 percent and below. Um, we have acknowledged um, and, and we know um, that that is our weakest kind of position in answering for our constituents that are at the 30 um, percent and below for many different, um, well, many different reasons, um, specifically because those wraparound services are necessary, and, and we've challenged uh, the manager over the past couple of years um, uh, to, to not make that um, an excuse. So um, I would count this as another one of those tools um, in our Swiss Army knife. Uh, we might not be able to keep it in our pocket um, much longer. We might have to put it in a backpack, something like that. So thank you. All right. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Heath, so I'll actually have some questions for you. <laughs> we did have a really robust conversation, which I appreciate, but for the sake of transparency and making sure that some information makes its way to the minutes for future council, one of the questions that I presented to you earlier today was in regards to Long term, part of this request is requesting for the taxes to be allocated specifically for the, op the opportunity to use it as a subsidy, both the city taxes and the county taxes. This current facility, Preparatory, is about 95% capacity, full transparency. I did a Google search. They have about six to eight units that are available now between 13 and 1600. The question that I have is, are those subsidies directly tied to pepper tree or are those future subsidies going to be available to the Charlotte community? Mainly because according to the language, the, the subsidies will be triggered when there is a lease renewal or a new resident moving in. So, and you shared with me what your understanding was, and hopefully you were able to get a little bit more information. If you could share that again, please. Yes, thank you for the question, Councilmember Mayfield. So under this arrangement, 44 of the units would be devoted to the rental subsidy program. And through natural attrition, as units become available, the property manager would look to populate those units with individuals from the community that are essentially referred through the continuum of care coordinated entry process. So this would be on a go forward basis, an opportunity to provide housing with a rental subsidy supported by both the city and the county to individuals at that 30% NAMI below level just at the pepper tree complex itself. So previously when I served and I had the opportunity to serve as chair of housing and neighborhood development committee, that's where we probably would have dug a little deeper in this. So it would be helpful to understand 44 units. We're saying up to 127,000 of potential tax revenue from the county, about 90 plus thousand from the city. Let's just think about that dollar amount and we're saying it, it, that it is designated for pepper tree and it's 44 units. We're also saying, according to this proposal, that there will be a reduction in the current rental cost because the rental cost is up to 1600 or more. So when it's time for a lease renewal, we may have the opportunity to reduce those rents. But if we're talking about specifically 44 subsidies and we're potential subsidies based on lease renewal, 
I would like for us as we move forward, I think this is a great starting point and I will be supporting it, but I would like for us to really look at the language that we put in place because when we just do the basic numbers on what we're anticipating to be a return on the reallocation of tax dollars going to the subsidies, how much are we actually talking about that will be utilized in subsidies versus how much we're getting back in tax revenue? And are those funds going to then be put in the general fund? Where would it go for it to be accessible to the broader community? And if not, what really would be the benefit to the residents current as well as those, as was mentioned by Mr. Vicari, if we're giving you the opportunity and you're able to grow and you move out of the complex and the new person is coming in, that tracking mechanism that correlates with those dollar amounts. That would be helpful, Mr. Manager. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heath. Thank you. All right, Ms. Johnson. I don't have any questions. I'm, lo I'm just looking forward to supporting a creative model in order to address the crisis. So thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sean, first of all, thank you. This is great leadership, and I appreciate the one-on-one. -on -one. And I hope our citizens realize that this is a new model for us, to have the private community partner with the city and the county. This is a total of $56 million project, and the city has actually put $8 million, the county has actually put $4 million. We're leveraging one to six, so we are uh, using our taxpayer dollars wisely, but I think we're addressing a big problem in our community, is preserving affordable housing. So great job and looking forward to partnering with them in the future. All right, Ms. Molina. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, man, I can't illustrate my excitement about this the project. Like I am like through the moon. I'm like so excited um, to see something so innovative come to uh, East Charlotte. I am excited for our residents. I'm excited for our constituents. I'm excited about the potential um, and, and as all of my colleagues around the dais have said, they've all had amazing points, and I agree with all of them largely. Um, we have a great tool that we will learn from, and it definitely has some areas of opportunity. Just today, um, one of our key stakeholders reached out to me from Charlotte East, and he brought to my attention, although very excited, which was, I, I, actually, I was nervous when I saw the email. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> he's about to say, like, I don't like it. Just, you know, I don't like it. Uh, but he actually mentioned that he was excited about it, except for the fact, you know, the more to the point of what Mr. Bakari was saying, you know, as we, you know, unpack this opportunity, you know, that we continue to look at ways that we can be better. Um, and so I definitely am a believer and have an appetite for let's get started and we can monitor and control our baseline along the way. So I am 100 plus percent in support of this opportunity. I'm so thankful to our county stakeholders for coming to the table because this is, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, their first time, as I was told today, coming to the table for such a project. And so I am so grateful to the county for seeing the value in this, uh, in this opportunity. And like Council Member Mitchell said, there's a $56 million investment. So the largest portion of this investment is not coming from the city or the county. This is the private uh, sector. And, and they believe in this opportunity too. So that's, that makes me even more excited about you know, what we have in our hands and the potential for growth and, and to model it uh, throughout the city and prevent those um, Pre prevent our residents throughout where we're able to from experiencing displacement. So thank you so much, Mr. Heath. Ms. Mm -hmm. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I agree with what's already been said. Uh, my questions around the funding were already addressed by Ms. Harris, so thank you. And Mr. Heath, appreciate your leadership on this. All right. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor of the adoption of the items in item number nine, A, B, and C, please raise your hand. All right, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Appreciate the work. We, we are going to have a great opportunity as a council to make some decisions in these new ideas that everyone has, um, how, who we serve, how we serve them, how we um, help. This is something that I believe that while we had the trust fund, um, thanks for the 20-year report because I think it gave all of us a baseline to think about what's next. And so um, this fall, as we go get ready for how do we connect 
the dots between a job, a house, and the ability to move between the two is going to be very important. So let's bring our best ideas and what we need to be thinking about to get it accomplished. So with that, I'm going to go back to our um, agenda item and start in the um, next item, which is uh, agenda item number seven, um, our sponsorship policy revisions, adopt a resolution revising the council adopted sponsorship policy to account for exclusive sponsorships provided for specific animal care and control adoption clinic and missing person events. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hands. All right, that motion passes. Next item is item number eight. Um, this is a grant for alternatives to violence program expansion, authorizing the city manager or his designee to accept a grant in the amount of a million dollars from the United States Department of Justice to expand the implementation of the alternatives to violence program in Charlotte and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating said funds. We had a very in-depth presentation on the alternative to violence expansion program earlier, and I, if you were live streaming or watching, if not, please go back and rewind, and you can see the council's um, workshop so that you can also view the discussion around this topic. So with that, do I have a motion for so items A and B? And second. do I have a second? second? We have a second. Is there any discussion? All right. Um, Ms. Johnson, followed by Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And we did have an in-depth discussion regarding this uh, project. And then afterwards, we had the disparity study. So again, I just want to reiterate the, uh, the, 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 the my desire to see an opportunity for a minority local business to, to have an opportunity for this contract. I think this is an opportunity for us to put our, our, our votes and our contracts where, our, where we know that there is a need and where our mouths are. So I'll be supporting, but um, uh, as I stated earlier, I, I, I advocated for a local minority business to, to be the administrator of the contract the first time, and I'll be advocating for that again, as, especially when part of the reason was that the smaller or the local organization didn't have the ability to collect the data or monitor the data, and then, we, and then that's... Um, the data is skewed right now um, with the current um, contract. So I just want to put that on record. Thank you. All right. Mr. Mitchell. Madam Mayor, thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you to Congresswoman Emma Adams, part of the presentation. There was a special appreciation for her, her leadership and effort. So thank you, Congresswoman Adams, for advocating on behalf of the city of Charlotte. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, to Mr. Mitchell's point, um, this was um, part of the work uh, that goes on the legislative agenda. Um, this is something uh, that council members um, have been advocating for in general. It's been a it's been a standing item. Um, so, you know, just just a note of reference for our new council members as well as uh, the the public, um, how our, our different buckets of work um, really do work together with us, but uh, with our partners across governments to make things like this happen. Thank you. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to echo the thank you for our Congresswoman for her leadership and continuing to guide and identify resources and opportunities for her constituents within Charlotte. And I also support Councilmember Johnson's request. This is a conversation that has been held many times around this dais regarding opportunities with minority businesses and creating an opportunity for a company that is already connected to Charlotte and has already been doing work in Charlotte to lead this discussion as far as how we move forward in dispersing this million dollars and understanding the million dollars is not just for one individual organization would really give us the opportunity to not only achieve our goals, but make sure that we have individuals who have the community's best interests at heart, opposed to trying to step in and learn the connections and the opportunities within our community. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Mayfield. All right, we have any further discussion? 
All in favor of the item on A and B, please raise your hands. All right, that's unanimous. The next item is item number nine. We approve nine. Let's go to item number 10, which is um, Cats and Central Line Regional Council Interlocal Agreement Amendment to adopt a resolution amending the Charlotte Area Transit System and Central Line Regional Council's Interlocal Agreement for additional Connect Beyond Operational Planning and Coordination Services and be to authorize the manager to amend the agreement consistent for the purpose which you approve or adopt. So um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. So I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I'll, uh, Ms. Ashmira. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to recognize the true regional approach to solving our transportation and infrastructure issues. So this is really a first time that I have seen in on our agenda an item that is uh, transportation related that is truly a regional approach. So uh, I was glad to see it and I'm looking forward to supporting it. All right, thank you very much. All right, are we ready to vote? Everyone in favor, please raise your hand. All right, that's unanimous. So um, the next item on our agenda is item 11, um, adopt a, a CATS shuttle bus service agreement, adopt a resolution ratifying an interlocal agreement with Mecklenburg County to provide shuttle, shuttle service to the public swimming beach at Ramsey Creek Park and authorize the city manager to renew the agreement for up to two one-year terms and amend its consistent in the purpose for which we'll it was approved. A &B. We have a motion second. and a second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion. Oh, Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the discussion, the comment is really for the sake of public record. I do want to acknowledge the fact that this is a short term. This is basically peak season that this contract is moving forward and is completely covered because I did have some individuals reach out regarding why we're having this discussion when we have some challenges within transportation of cats. But this is a very specific request and that request is the funding has been identified and allocated, but it is basically for the peak season to utilize this resource that has been provided by the county. Thank you very much, Ms. Mayfield. Any other comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the item, please raise your hand. And that is unanimous vote. Oh, no, it's not in any opposition. Um, we have one, um, Mr. Bakari, in opposition. The next item is agenda item number 12, exchange of land rights along the Lynx Light Rail Corridor with Charlotte Hawkins, LLC. Adopt a resolution authorizing the exchange of land rights between the city of Charlotte and Charlotte Hawkins or its successors involving parcel identification, which is along the light rail line. It's a lot of other numbers too. Authorize, and the second is authorizing the manager to execute the necessary documents to complete the exchange. Um, this is to build a mixed-use residential development and to trade properties at the um, price or value um, with an appraisal. So with that, Move for um, approval. we have and a second. motion and a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Mayfield? So, Mayor, I will not be supporting this agenda item tonight, but mainly as a former representative of District 3, and South End, there was a lot of opportunities along the light rail that have been missed over the years, especially when we continue to have conversations about housing diversity. And when you look at what has happened in South End area and how that has really bled all the way back to Tryon and even further down regarding affordability, accessibility, what was initially thought would be a opportunity for growth has, well, it is an opportunity for growth. The challenge is who's receiving access to that opportunity. So a lot of the residents who formerly utilized our light rail as their main form of transportation have been completely displaced. So now it is of convenience. So this particular project just seems like another opportunity where we could have created a very different conversation when we're talking about diversifying the housing stock in the area and there's no conversation in this project that addresses that. So I will not be able to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? All right, hearing none. 
All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Those that are opposed, we have three opposed, Mr. Bakari, Ms. Mayfield, and Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. The next item is the Regional Express Bus Service Agreement to Rock Hill. Adopt a resolution ratifying the Interlocal Regional Express Bus Service Agreement with the City of Charlotte, the City of Rock Hill to operate express bus service and authorize the manager to renew the agreement for up to four one-year terms and to amend it consistent for which the purpose that you approve. And um, do I have a motion? So to move may a actions A and B. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hands. All right, all of those opposed, Mr. Bakari, thank you. All right, the next item um, is item 14, and I believe that the staff has asked us not to address this item. So we'll go to item 15, which is the Rhine Road Water Main Extension to approve a development agreement with the U.S. Alliance Rhine Venture for a water main construction as a part of Rhine Road Water Main Extension Project, authorizing the manager to amend the agreement for the purposes that you agree upon and adopt a budget ordinance appropriating $949,000 from U.S. Alliance Rhine Venture for a portion of the water main extension project on the same site. Um, do I have a motion? Move for approval A, B, and C. Second. Do we have a, and we have a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. All right, the next um, item on the agenda are the nominations that we have, and we have a speaker for our nominations. Um, so is that okay to have that right now? We'll go ahead and have the speaker. Um, Madam Clerk, I am looking for. The speaker is John Holmes. Mr. Holmes, would you come down to the podium to address us? You have three minutes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, City Council and you know, the Charlotte government, it's a pleasure to make my introduction. Some of you already know me. I'm John Holmes. Uh, one of the biggest things is with the Bicycle Advisory Committee, I really want to try and make sure that we are pushing for a fast and equitable distribution of our bicycle network throughout the city. Um, I am very happy with the infrastructure we have in Uptown, but unfortunately what I've seen firsthand is that it primarily connects to the wealthier portions of our city and leaves residents such as myself and those in West Charlotte and North Charlotte, otherwise known as the Arc, just hung out to dry. What I'd like to see is a reshaping of the budget to kind of prioritize a fast and quick network that we can then build up later to be just as good as the Uptown Cycle Network. In addition to that, I also want to try and make sure that the Bicycle Advisory Committee is transparent. Currently, if you want to attend it, you can certainly attend it, but um, if you want to watch it virtually, you can't do that. And also the other item as well is that you would have to basically wait two months on average for the meeting that's to come about. I don't think that's really the best approach if you're trying to be involved in this as well. Um, if you guys have any questions or comments, I am more than happy to answer them. Again, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much for your comments and, and your perspective on this. We really appreciate the opportunity to hear some things that we might do better. Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. I'd also like to recognize um, Council Member Driggs for a discussion um, that he and I have been having maybe with along with several of you um, regarding the um, privatization and comp competition committee uh, thank you madam mayor <clears throat> and I'm speaking I guess as chair of the governance committee but uh, I've been involved in conversations with the PCAC for some time and uh, I think some key points I'd like to make is we have four vacancies on the committee that are being considered on our ballot tonight um, historically the PCAC was created by City Council in 1993 with a primary charge of looking at managed competitions, as it was called, in the city's operations and provision of services. So at that time, it was the idea was that it would use a kind of yellow pages approach to determine the appropriateness of city provided services if the city provided any service that could be found in the yellow pages, i.e. could be provided by somebody else. Um, we've really kind of moved on since then, and th that role as such <coughs> uh, doesn't exist. In April of this month, the chair of the PCAC sent to the mayor and city council a request to consider changing the charge of the committee, citing a need to either change the charge of the committee to better reflect current city priorities 
or provide feedback to the committee regarding the committee's future. And this came out of a sense on the part of the chair and members of the committee that there was, they were not doing meaningful work. And I would like to offer you this. Uh, I don't know how many of us have seen this. This is a very detailed report on which the committee spent a great deal of time talking about our cemeteries. Um, and they have a sense, uh, I think rightly, that, uh, th that this is probably not going to have a large impact on the way we manage our cemeteries. So um, we got down to having conversations about things that they might tackle for us. And my feeling was that a number of the proposals were headed in the same direction. Uh, kind of a make work thing, finding something for them to do, involving a lot of their time and staff time. Um, I think it's unfortunate that since April, when we confronted the question of whether this committee uh, should continue to exist, we didn't actually reach a conclusion. So instead, we kind of went back and we started looking again to see if we could come up with something. Uh, it's really not fair to the members of the committee or to the staff. And <coughs> Um, they, they have struggled actually for a couple of years now uh, to come up with serious things. The recycling services contract, they did this report. In any case, after consultation with the staff, the chair of the PCAC and the mayor, uh, I would like to recommend that we vote on September 26 uh, to disband or decommission this committee. And I have talked to the chair again, to members. Um, I would also like to recommend that uh, members of the committee who want to serve on a different committee after this dissolution be invited to submit applications for those other committees, which will then be highlighted in our nominations packets for special attention so that maybe we can give them the benefit of like a reappointment somewhere else. Um, I think it's important that we emphasize our gratitude for the work that the PCAC has done over the years and for the willingness of the members. There's some very capable people in that group. I think it's unfortunate that it's hard for us to carve out a bigger role for them, but really the best thing for them in the city right now would be for us to vote on the 26th to discontinue their activity. Wow. All right. Can I? Yes, Mr. Yeah. Bakari. I, I, would, I, I would wager that I'm maybe on this dais the only person who served on that committee for multiple years. So I, I, I will tell you, I, I have a deep perspective of the potential value of this committee. I would agree, and they probably feel like many of our committees, they're kind of arm's length held away from the critical path of the city. And we've talked about this for years. I've served on a number of committees, and I, my, my greatest learning from all of that was that all of our work seemed in a lot of cases to go into dark holes where I wasn't sure how it made it to us. We've got to attack that broader problem uh, as a group, and that would be a great one for us to take on now. But specifically to PCAC, um, if you think about why it was formed and some good work that's been done over the years, obviously times have evolved, they need a, a better scope. I think it would be behoove us to give them a scope because whether it's privatization or the broader term of competition, they that should be our, our free market uh, audit of the entire organization to go through and say and have carte blanche ability to look at everything we do and say should we be doing that and give us analysis to say it could be done better this way or outside of the walls here or should we be stockpiling up all of the real estate that we have playing real estate czar in town you know these are questions that we have a capable group of people that their charter is to look at what it is that we that we are doing and ask the question and analyze it with thoughts to us of should we be doing it so i i mean that clearly takes care and feeding and some structuring of of their mandate if we're not prepared to do that then yes we should absolutely disband it but i do believe that the value of that committee that's one of the more meaningful bodies of work should we get that thing tuned up properly so as someone that worked with that committee way before Mr. Bakari served on it. Um, it was a part of a competition and a whole privatization of government study and effort. Sure. These folks are highly talented and valued. And we have other committees like the Business Advisory Committee. We have other committees that are actually needing that kind of expertise. So as I agree with both 
Mr. Bakari, Mr. Driggs, but I do think the idea of having a way to make them actually valued because they are really good people that care and have bring expertise to the table. If we would actually look at one of our several, I mean, I know there are over 50 um, boards and commissions, but those that deal with business. And then in addition to that, we also have some areas where we're going to be talking about how we implement the UDO and what is the cost of it. That would be something that they could do. And so I, I don't know how we talk about this in a way that keeps them or gives them a charge. I think there's work that there are charges out there already that are need the expertise that they have. So I just think I'd offer another um, view of it, talented people that care deeply about it. And out of all of these committees that we have, where can they serve best and what can they bring their expertise to help us do? Um, Mayor Pro the, the common ground is that the status quo of, of this committee is, is not sufficient. Um, you know, um, perhaps we do put it on the future agenda, whether it's the 26 or, or, or another one, um, and then we work together um, to figure out what the right motion is to make um, um, f for the future of, of this particular committee. Um, Mr. Driggs suggested um, disbandment and uh, preferred status for existing members, and Mr. Bakari has, you know, suggested um, a, a, a different a different approach as opposed to that yellow pages approach that Mr. Driggs mentioned. Um, but maybe it's up to us to figure out um, what is the best way to work with this, and if it's two weeks, you know, where we can talk to, amongst each other to figure out what that right direction is. So be it. Um, if not, we can always make a motion to defer to a further date. <laughs> um, that's necessary. So, Mr. Driggs? <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to emphasize the fact we, we have been working for a long time uh, on this issue of finding something. And I question whether the members of this council and a lot of the staff, um, as we discuss with each other, these decisions that we have to make will be responsive in practice to input from what is essentially a lay group of citizens uh, in the midst of, of the kind of exchange, the crossfire between us and the staff. And, and that has been their experience. They, they just, uh, they, they don't come and speak to us. Uh, uh, and I, I highlight this because this is something they produced. Uh, they put a lot of time into it. So I, I hope what we can do for right now is schedule a vote for the 26, up or down, right? This, it, it, all it is is uh, that will be the time when we determine uh, whether the liquidation is. But I would also suggest that we not uh, process nominations tonight, but wait until we see the outcome of this conversation to consider who might be appointed so as not to be putting people on right before we possibly disband. So you've heard Mr. Drake's suggestion that we um Remove from the agenda the appointments of the privatization committee. Um, I certainly can do that if everyone agrees, but I want to make sure that everyone understands that what we're doing is talking about how do we work with this group and include their decision making and conversation in it. I, I don't think you impose things on people. You actually ask them. And Mr. Driggs has been very, very generous in his time and commitment to at talking with the group and the entire um, um, membership that's basically coming off. So um, let me ask, uh, did Ms. Johnson? I do have a question. Uh -huh. I think that Council Member Driggs brings to, to mind a broader issue that all of our, there might be other committees that, that feel that they don't have access to council or that aren't being heard. So I, would, I think this, that we could use this as an opportunity to reach out to the committee chairs, uh, Mr. Jones. If you I, can I committee? add something to that? In your um, committee assignments that will be coming out tomorrow, if you'll recall, there was a discussion on this council. Every committee has an annual report mm -hmm. that has been sent to the clerk's office and council has not dealt with it. So it's, some of this is on us. So in the committee discussion tomorrow, you will be assigned a group of those committees based okay. upon the um, type of work that they're doing to have your annual review of their report. So that's something that we'll ask every committee to do because right now I don't think we're fulfilling <clears throat> what you said, Ms. Johnson, and we have an obligation to do right. that. So it'll be coming out in the uh, memo tomorrow that you'll have, most of them are about 8 to 10. Mm -hmm. So we have over 40 
or so committees. Some people have even more. But if you're on that committee, you will be asked to review and provide feedback to the council on those committee, the committee annual reports. Uh, Madam Clerk told me that it would be December, that the reports are in, and we're asking for your review in the um, first quarter of next year. I, so I think he brings up a great point. So if we're going to make changes to that process or if there's an opportunity for improvement, maybe we should do that as a whole instead of looking at one committee right now. Mayor, could I, could I just comment? Uh, yes, please. This committee is the squeaky wheel. They started in April raising objections and, and, and questioning the particular mandate. So we spent time going back and forth about whether we could create a new mandate for them that better aligned with the needs of council and staff and really were not able. Uh, it was a process of trying to make something up uh, as opposed to responding to a need. So this committee is different from the others to the extent that we have had that input from them. I'd second Mr. Driggs motion to suspend the nominations to the privatization and competition advisory committee. All right. Um I don't know if we need a vote to do that. We'll just, I just, Madam Clerk, remove it from the agenda or this item. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Mr. Bakari. Just uh, one final point. Um, I, I agree uh, that we should take that off. And if this is indeed the squeaky wheel that hasn't been addressed for a while, and I had deep conversations with them last year, I went to committee meetings. They were excited about an opportunity to, to recalibrate, but again, it just hasn't gotten done. I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to do this for all committees, though. Um, that, that, that doesn't mean that we don't make sure we address their initial problems, but we've got it. We've been talking about this for five years. We have to solve the committee issue because I would wager, I mean, I've personally served on the Business Advisory Committee, the CRC, the PCAC for years at a time, and I, we did great work, and I rarely felt like we ever connected with council at all, ever. So. We've got these talented people that could be doing not just what they think they need to do, but work that we could deliver them. We could say all of your output shouldn't be in a report. It should be in the form of a legislative agenda for us to, to, to enact in policy and in ordinances. So we've got to do something, though, because we might as well shut them all down. There's 30 plus boards and commissions. We might as well shut them all down if we're not going to take it seriously and allow it to be a part of the critical path of the work we do. So I, I think we can do that offline together. We can get through tonight. That makes sense. And I just had a final question. What, what are the yellow pages? <laughs> <laughs> the yellow pages idea was that you could look it up and so, find it somewhere okay, in a okay, book. Okay, okay, um, okay. Oh, what I, are I they? Think, yeah, yeah. In a physical book? I think <laughs> yeah, I'm old enough to remember. So I think that uh, each committee will have the opportunity to review all of their committee work and make some of these recommendations to see if what we've been talking about is actually valid and true. And then we'll have an idea. So we'll put that in the referral for the committee review, not just the review of their annual reports, but your comments and suggestions for where, if there are changes that are necessary. Okay, with that, um, Madam Clerk, um, we now are at the nominations for the remaining portion of it, and I'm going to recognize you. Do you need anything, any additional information from the council? There are several of the boards that have received six or more nominations. So with a vote, a motion, a second, and a vote of council, these individuals can be appointed tonight. The other nominations will come to you in the form of a memo or email from our office tomorrow, and those will not be read tonight. Um, but for the purposes of um, making um, the necessary vote, the Alternative Compliance Review Committee, Priscilla Ash received 10 nominations. For the Arts and Science Council Advisory Committee, um, the at-large Northwest District Representative, Michelle Hook, received nine nominations. Also for the Arts and Science Council, uh, the District 1 representative, Ferris Keeley, Kalili, received um, a nomination from Council Member Anderson. For the District 4 uh, representative, Drew Burdick received a nomination from Council Member Johnson. For District 5, Philip Freeman received a nomination from Council Member Molina. 
for the uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee, John Holmes received 10 nominations. For the. Get uh, <laughs> <laughs> ready, John. I know. <laughs> No recommendations have been received for the Business Advisory Committee from the two uh, groups that we're waiting uh, for their information, nor have we received recommendations for uh, the um, Charlotte Business Inclusion Advisory Committee. For the Charlotte International Cabinet, Ricard Henricks received eight nominations. For the Citizens Review Board, Samuel Smith, an incumbent, received nine nominations. For the Domestic Violence Advisory Board, the incumbent, Iman North, received seven nominations. Uh, no nominations for the Historic District Commission. Uh, seats that are open for the Keep Charlotte Beautiful. Um, Mark Laughlin received nine nominations, as did Ashel Summerman for the Mint Museum Board of Trustees. Roxanne Trinkelbach received 10 nominations um, for the Neighborhood Business, the Neighborhood Matching Grants Fund. Jonathan Utrip received 10 nominations. And for finally, for the Zoning Board of Adjustment, Ling Yi Sun received six nominations. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations or the so um, motion Second. For the, of the city clerk for those nominees receiving six or more votes? We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right. I think that's unanimous. All right. So we are now, do we have a motion to adjourn? All right. Move. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. No, it's not.